My name is Faranja Wahabzada, and I'm advisor at GIZ supporting the hydrogen at, in Davis of Germany on international level within its energy partnerships. And I'm pleased to moderate you through the next three and a half hours with uh, the next uh, workshop of today. We have around 100 participants. So why actually this workshop during the German Greek state secretary consultations in December 2020, it was agreed to have an experience exchange on the production and usage of green hydrogen and its derivatives. And so then uh, this workshop was initiated by the German ambassador in Athens in cooperation with the Greek Minister of Environment and Energy and co-organized jointly with the Chamber of Commerce and Industry and GIZ. So we are very delighted to have you both, His Excellency's Ambassador Dr. Reichel and Minister Skrekos here today to open this workshop. And uh, Ambassador Dr. Reichel, since 1988, um, you had been responsible for various departments in the German Ministry for Foreign Affairs and had had many embassies already in Eastern Europe. And since 2019, you had the embassy in Greece, and we are very pleased to have you here today. Your Excellency Ambassador Reichel, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh... Minister Skrekas, uh, Secretary General Stuku, dear hydrogen experts in Greece and Germany, dear co-organizers of this workshop, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I would like to warmly welcome you to this first Greek-German expert workshop on green hydrogen, which the German embassy is jointly organizing, as was mentioned, with the Greek-German Chamber of Commerce and Industries and the German Corporation for Intern Cooperation for International Cooperation, GIZ. I am particularly grateful for the support of the Greek Ministry uh, of Environment and Energy. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning. I think we all agree that sustainable development, renewable energies and greater energy efficiency are of the utmost importance in shaping this green new decade we are living in in making the energy shift successful and thereby in doing our share to combat climate change. I'm convinced green hydrogen is a key resource in this endeavor, both in Greece and Germany and in many other countries. Hydrogen is the talk of the town. Uh, Germany will be investing 2 billion euros over the coming years to stimulate the formation of an international hydrogen energy market. Ladies and gentlemen, a year ago, the, a German hydrogen strategy was adopted and a national hydrogen council was set up. Likewise, in Greece, an expert committee is currently defining a Greek national strategy. With the European Green Deal, the European Union has demonstrated that, that it is ready to take the lead and create very substantial incentives. Parliamentary State Secretary Rachel, who was so friendly to provide us with a video message, will be talking about hydrogen Europe in a minute. Greece has high potential to become a hub for the production of green hydrogen. This country is blessed with all sorts of renewable energy resources. The minister and the secretary general, I'm glad to note, are the base, major drivers behind these efforts. White Dragon, the Greek plan for the production of environmentally friendly hydrogen as fuel is set for takeoff, as Kathy Mirini titled last month. Therefore, the way we see it, everything is lined up and ready to go for a new era in which green hydrogen brings Greece and Germany together, even closer than they, we already are. Just a few days ago, for example, the Christian Democratic party leader in Germany, Armin Laschet, proposed an energy alliance with the Mediterranean countries based on green hydrogen. Dear participants, it is a pleasure to see that so many distinguished experts from both countries are ready to kick off the bilateral dialogue today. Over the last eight years, uh, the federal government in Germany has been in very close cooperation, also via the, G via the GIZ, with the Greek Ministry of Environment and Energy. This cooperation has borne fruits already 
For this reason also, the Greek-German action plan in its recent update, it was mentioned at the beginning, uh, for the first time mentioned Greek hydrogen as a field for future bilateral cooperation. And this morning, we are taking the next step, bringing together representatives from the two national commissions for hydrogen, if only virtually due to the pandemic restrictions. And I am very confident that this is only the beginning and many more steps will follow by which we will move on to be the avant-garde in this technology of the future. Thank you all for your interest and thank you very much once again, everybody. Thank you, Ambassador Reicher, for these warm welcoming remarks, uh, raising also the importance of a green uh, Greek German hydrogen collaboration. And now I would like to hand over the microphone to our next high ranking guest for the opening, His Excellency Minister Konstantinos Krekas, Minister for Environment and Energy of Greece. Before leading the ministry, you held many key positions also in other ministries and the parliament, and it is equally an honor having you here today. The word is yours. Well, good morning uh, to everybody, dear Ambassador, dear State Secretary, Professor Kelemis. Uh, congratulations, first of all, for this great initiative uh, to organize today's uh, event. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be addressing this stimulating workshop uh, today, which is dedicated to, to green hydrogen. This event clearly demonstrates the constructive cooperation between our countries and the great potential in the emerging hydrogen economy. It is clear that uh, hydrogen unravels various opportunities for bilateral collaborations, including technology transfer, uh, exciting uh, pilot projects, uh, scale-up applications, and of course, uh, joint ventures for production sites. Uh, let me say, before referring to hydrogen developments in Greece, that, uh, uh, that uh, some, uh, there are some key uh, crucial uh, elements of our energy policy uh, and uh, achievements. Uh, first of all, let me say that I firmly believe that uh, the green transformation of our economies, of course, uh, as Ambassador said, is a key instrument for growth and resilience. And that is why our Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis has strongly emphasized this principle, inspiring ambitious policies and uh, promoting international uh, initiatives. And nowadays in Greece, we have adopted and currently implementing one of the most ambitious energy and climate plans in Europe. Day by day, we are actively transforming our country, promoting stable frameworks, uh, fair incentives and, of course, innovation. Uh, let me say that the green investments we intend uh, to mobilize by 2030 exceed 44 billion euros. Five uh, of them, 5 billion euros, uh, are already, uh, already allocated uh, for uh, 21 green actions, uh, which be, will be financed by the European Recovery, Recovery and Resilience Fund. Uh, more specifically, uh, we are uh, decarbonizing our energy mix at a faster pace than every, uh, any other European country, phasing out all existing lignite plants by 2023, 20, apart from one which will be converted into a gas power plant uh, in 2025. We also uh, have simplified significantly renewables licensing with uh, digitalized, fast and transparent processes. Okay. 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 of uh, simplifications uh, regarding grid connections in environmental uh, in, uh, terms. Uh, we also uh, promoting uh, strongly the, uh, the establishment of the first uh, green uh, PPA within 2021 if possible, but for sure uh, in 2022. We actively support natural gas as a traditional, traditional fuel. We are upgrading and expanding our electricity networks. This is the only way uh, to achieve the, the targets of 2030 regarding the uh, participation, the contribution of renewables uh, into our energy mix. Uh, we unlock the potential of uh, offshore wind and energy storage, uh, both in terms of batteries and uh, hydro pumping. Uh, we promote the energy efficiency. efficiency. We, have, uh, designed, we have designed a huge innovation wave uh, 
which also a part of it is going to be financed by RRF, and also we promote uh, e-mobility with great results uh, in, the, in the last months. Uh, we develop a strategy for the small transition of coal regions because nobody should uh, stay behind. And uh, we coordinate the transformation of our, uh, of our islands into innovation hubs. And last but not uh, least, of course, we're devising a national strategy for hydrogen. Hydrogen is uh, a key decarbonization tool uh, for several sectors to our point of view. It can transform gas infrastructure, energy intensive industrial processes, uh, such as chemicals and steel making, and of course, transportation, including maritime, aviation, and heavy duty vehicles. Uh, hydrogen uh, can even reshape international trade by creating exporting countries and transportation routes. It can act as uh, electricity storage as well, and also create revenue streams for renewables at times when subsidies will be phased out. In Greece, hydrogen is also linked to the transition of coal regions and the creations of quality jobs. And it is also related to new gas infrastructure providing fuel flexibility and affecting stranded assets. In this context, let me say that uh, ISMED is uh, also uh, going to be a hydrogen-ready pipeline. The same could apply to the underground storage in Kavala that we are planning to, to do. We are also assessing the acceptable blending percentage for our gas distribution networks, together with DESFA, uh, our TSO operator. Therefore, uh, that is why our National Hydrogen Committee, set up last December, will propose our national, our coherent national hydrogen strategy by June. A detailed ro a roadmap will cover the entire value of chain, uh, of uh, uh, the value chain of, of hydrogen. Uh, we intend to stimulate demand and at the same time start delivering the necessary uh, infrastructure at all levels from upstream to downstream. Uh, let me also say, and this is very encouraging, that uh, um, besides our successful entry to the European Battery Innovation Project, the Greek uh, call on hydrogen technologies and systems has attracted more than 20 applications which are currently under uh, review and evaluation. So, uh, indeed, uh, uh, the European Hydrogen Strategy, uh, which was launched in July, set uh, concrete milestones for electrolyzers and renewable hydrogen. It supports, it supports also low carbon hydrogen from uh, fossil fuels for a transition period. And we definitely need a coordination uh, in order to go forward at a faster pace. We need clarity on incentive schemes and uh, clear regulator, uh, regulatory frameworks to boost uh, hydrogen demand and also create a level playing uh, field. Uh, we also need the uh, emphasis on innovation and research funding to allow cost efficiency and cross-sector synergies. Hydrogen is not a long-term vision. Following the leadership of the German presidency in 2020, a hydrogen economy seems more possible and more plausible than ever. Several challenges, of course, lie ahead, but if we join forces and if we work intensively together, we can untap a huge potential because finally, we all must do more to protect our planet. So thank you very much for this invitation, the kind invitation. Congratulations again for this great uh, initiative. Thank you, Your Excellency. Many thanks for your welcoming words, which have given a clear picture of Greece's energy visions and the will for developing green hydrogen. Now I would like to introduce you to Mr. Thomas Rache, which was mentioned earlier by the ambassador. He's known to many of you, but who could not unfortunately be live among us. He managed though to record his welcoming. Thomas Rachel is Parliamentary State Secretary at the Federal Ministry of Education and Research since 2005 and a member of the German Bundestag since 1994. And he has very strong ties to Greece already as he founded the Greece Initiative in Germany. And for many years, he was Vice Chairman of the German Greek Parliamentary 
friendship group. So let's play his welcoming recording. Yasas, Minister Skrikas, Excellency, ladies and gentlemen. Today's motto could just as well be from the coal and steel community to a hydrogen union. Despite all the human and economic challenges this COVID-19 has posed, we must not forget that climate change will remain the central global challenge in the coming decades. To achieve our climate goals, we must gear our energy system towards sustainability. This means bringing renewable energy into sectors where electrification is difficult, maritime transport and aviation, for example finding ways to import vast amounts of renewable energy. Green hydrogen produced from wind or solar power is a promising option to do so. The smallest atom on the periodic table can reshape the global energy market. Europe must not miss out on this unique opportunity. Green hydrogen can become a driver for new jobs and prosperity all over the continent. In industrial areas, as well as in regions which are rich in solar and wind power, like the Greek islands. We have the chance to become a global leader in an entirely new field. We must start out towards a green hydrogen economy now. Work has only just begun. For example, we must develop hydrogen solutions on industrial scale and make them competitive. We must set up cross-border transport infrastructures and networks for hydrogen generation and use. We need a new regulatory framework and market incentive programs that enable the transition towards sustainability. But one thing is clear. Even if many countries are already high committed, especially in Asia, only a European approach will succeed. We need to pull together to develop the cloud needed in the international competition. Purely national plans will fail, will fail. This is why the Commission was right to set up an ambitious plan leading the way towards a truly European hydrogen union. Adequate funding is available as projects for sustainable hydrogen are playing an important role in the next generation EU recovery plan. What we also need is the right mindset. Our European strategy will only be su successful if the Commission and the Member States work together and develop common ownership. Research and innovation can play a vital role in this. Last year, under the German Presidency, the Council called for a joint R&E agenda on hydrogen technologies. To put this into motion, we set up together with other member states, a flexible and inclusive process that is complementary to existing initiatives. Our goals are to identify research priorities in a community-driven approach, form a lasting network of all relevant stakeholders in Europe, and combine the scientific excellence of our research institutions with highly innovative businesses. We want to enable stakeholders from all over Europe to voice their opinion and ideas on hydrogen innovation in Europe. This will help us tackle the roadblocks on our way towards a competitive European hydrogen market. The, Rio, the European research area is the right framework for this initiative to exchange ideas and make a common effort. Ultimately, we want to draft a roadmap to integrate national and European processes in research and innovation. We aim for a strategic research agenda as a first step towards a cohesive environment to foster hydrogen innovations on all levels within the EU. I am glad that the Greek government has assumed a leading role in this undertaking. Together with Italy and Bulgaria, you will support the organization of a workshop on the topic of production of green hydrogen. Dear Minister Skrekas, this commitment testifies to true farsightness and respons responsibility with regard to ensuring long-term economic growth in Europe 
and actively shaping an emerging market. Thank you very much. The same applies to all of you today as you are moving towards setting up a sustainable hydrogen economy together. The European Atomic Energy Community and the European Coal and Steel Community ensured Europe's technological autonomy. This must also be our goal with the European Hydrogen Union. On this occasion, I would like to mention the long tradition of bilateral Greek German cooperation in research and innovation. We are currently funding 24 Greek German projects in very different thematic fields. Vice Minister Christos Dimas and I intend to continue our bilateral cooperation and to publish a new bilateral call in the near future. I'm delighted that we are working so actively with our Greek partners on these different levels. Thank you very much and good luck. Thank you very much, uh, His Excellency Rachel. It was a pleasure listening to uh, the video and understanding a bit more on the key factors that are uh, important for building and developing a hydrogen market, especially also in the field of innovation and R&D. So now we are reaching the final welcoming statement by our co-host, Professor Dr. Kilemis, who is General Manager and Member of the Board of Directors at the German Hellenic Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And since 2002, you are actively shaping, strengthening and encouraging the Greek-German uh, business relations. So it's a pleasure having you here. The word is yours. Thank you very much. Dear Minister, Mr. Krekas, Your Excellency Ambassador, Dr. Reichel, Madam Secretary General for Energy and Mineral Resources, Mrs. Duku, dear members of the Hydrogen Commission from both countries, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen. I would like, of course, also to thank you very much, all of you, for your participation in today's event, and especially the German Federal Foreign Office for the financial support of this workshop, the Embassy of the Federal Republic of Germany in Greece, and the German International Cooperation Agency, GZ, for the excellent cooperation as well as the Greek Ministry of Environment and Energy for their valuable support in order to organize and implement this Greek German expert workshop on green hydrogen. Last but not least, I would, I would like also to thank you, to thank all the distinguished speakers from both countries for their participation in today's workshop. Ladies and gentlemen, efforts for decreasing the climate change have led to extensive changes in global energy supply and use, and many countries today are looking for cleaner renewable energies to decarbonize their economies. One of the clean forms of zero carbon energy is, of course, hydrogen. It may be the most plentiful element in the universe, but it does not exist in elemental form on Earth. Today, hydrogen represents less than 2% of current energy consumption in Europe and is mainly used for the production of steel, chemicals such like plastics or fertilizers. The EU strategy on energy system integration is based on a vision for a smarter, more integrated and optimized energy system that supports decarbonization across all sectors. The EU has made it to a top priority to produce 13 times more clean hydrogen than today by 2024 and 130 times more by 2030. For this target, the European Commission has reserved funds of 470 billion euros for the development of the appropriate technology, application platforms, and of course, infrastructure. There is no question that over time, hydrogen will increasingly establish its position, not only in the EU, but also in the world market. From my point of view, it's certain that a large portion of high value funds will be channeled into research and de development of hydrogen as a clean fuel. In Greece, according, 
to the estimations of European organizations, the potential of to develop renewable power production by 2030 is significant high. These opportunities also include the possibility of using the existing natural gas infrastructure for the transport and distribution of hydrogen by blending it or even for the exclusive use of hydrogen in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, Greece has excellent qualified resources and it would be a pity from my point of view to miss this significant opportunity to promote and a hydrogen investment program and strategy. And I have to say, there is a substantial relevant international experience so far to build upon. Let me point out that Germany has, can play an important role by the identification, implementation and use of hydrogen in Greece. Germany has invested heavily over the last years in the sector and has deep knowledge and experience through several strategic projects. In fact, the German, government, the German government expect that the demand of hydrogen will reach 90 to 110 terawatt hours by 2030. And therefore, a large amount of hydrogen will have to be imported in Germany. I believe that the hydrogen market will offer great potential for the developing bilateral scientific research and um, investment synergies between between Greece and Germany with mutual benefits from both countries. The German Hellenic Chamber of Commerce and Industry has already established economic and political communication channels between the two countries. On its belief that Greece will offer significant uh, investment opportunities over the next 10 years. In the near future, the Chamber intends to extend these channels in full confidence that in the time ahead, clean hydrogen, uh, green hydrogen can help Greece become a regional hub with a vital role in balancing the uh, European energy system. Ladies and gentlemen, let me finalize by saying that uh, there is a huge potential in cooperation in several economic fields between Greece and Germany in the area of green hydrogen with mutual benefits for both countries. And I'm confident that today's event is contributing in this direction. I look forward to hearing the views of the distinguished speakers. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Kalemis, for also underlining the potential of Greece when it comes to hydrogen. Dear Professor Kalemis, Your Excellencies, Ambassador Reichel and Minister Skrikas and State Secretary Rachel, for these very strong welcoming words and setting the scene for our workshop. It gives us a clear vision and guidance for the continuous discussions. So in a physical meeting, that would be the moment where we would applaud and uh, thank you for, uh, for your inputs. Um, you welcome. <laughs> thank you. Let's then shift uh, to the next session and dear participants dear ladies and gentlemen allow me first to introduce you the coming sessions in the first session we would basically look at the national targets and strategies for the production of hydrogen and in the second part we would then look at the perspective for the use of green hydrogen in germany and greece and for that we have among us distinguished guests from germany and greece and we know that given the dynamics of hydrogen um, these guests are speaking every day at many many workshops and meetings so we're happy to have you here and appreciate your time uh, to share also your experience and knowledge in this work so so before we start allow me tiny uh, technical notes, uh, one to the speakers, please mute the micros and unmute your mic directly when you speak. And the other uh, note goes to the audience, please pose your questions also in the chat and like the questions uh, you want to see also answered. With that, um, so I would like to start uh, the first session 
And I would like to bring Mrs. Alexandra Suduku, who is General Secretary for Energy and Minor Mineral Resources at the Greek Ministry of Environment and Energy on our virtual stage. Uh, from uh, energy policymaker, advisor to head of cabinet and general secretary, you have worked in various ministries already for the Greek government and you are well known and appreciated expert in energy affairs and policy. And as it has been said already by the ministry, uh, your department is also among others responsible for the National Commission for Hydrogen, which is mandated to work on a hydrogen strategy until uh, June. Um, so we are very much curious to learn more about the status, the visions and the next steps when it comes to hydrogen in your, in your esteemed country. Mrs. Suduku, it is great having you here. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone, uh, Your Excellency Ambassador, um, State Secretary, uh, Mr. Rachel, uh, Dr. Kilemis, uh, all of you ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me also start by thanking uh, our hosts, Greek-German uh, Chamber of Commerce, uh, GIZ, uh, of course the Embassy of Germany in Greece, uh, for this opportunity uh, to share with you what are the national priorities for uh, hydrogen. Uh, although uh, we heard uh, Ambassador Minister Skrekas, uh, State Secretary Mr. Rachel, uh, also Mr. Kelemis, I think they all described on a very eloquent uh, way why uh, it's worth uh, fostering uh, these, all these hydrogen uh, initiatives and innovations. Um, so we are all very happy to, to understand that hydrogen is no longer an afterthought. Uh, it's quickly becoming one of the cornerstones of the decarbonization of the European economy uh, in a cost-effective way, in line, of course, with the European uh, Green Deal. And um, allow me to say a significant uh, driver of this acceleration is, uh, is the real effort undertaken uh, by the German presidency in 2020, uh, which set the EU pace and gave a strong uh, signal that Europe is committed to this technology. Uh, so I need to, to recognize these uh, efforts of our German uh, colleagues, uh, not only, of course, during the German presidency, uh, but also now uh, with the German ministry holding actually the, the chapeau of the, IPC, uh, the IPCA hydrogen technologies and systems. So Greece, um, also recognizes, uh, of course, the crucial role that the hydrogen will be called uh, to play in the years and uh, decades uh, to come. And uh, we're picking up the pace from a policy perspective, uh, aiming actually to put hydrogen uh, on the map uh, of our ambitious green uh, transition uh, journey. Allow me to, to provide you with uh, a few snapshots uh, of the steps we took so far. Uh, where we stand now and what are the next steps uh, forward. Um, in November 2020, uh, we submitted our uh, national positions on uh, developing a hydrogen market uh, in Europe, the EU hydrogen uh, strategy for uh, this climate neutral uh, Europe to the German presidency. Um, of course, this document was, uh, was a collective work uh, which reflected uh, our national priorities and uh, targets on hydrogen. Then um, in December 2020, we formed our National Hydrogen Committee. Um, this uh, initiated uh, its works in uh, January and it has a, a clear mandate to, to develop our national uh, hydrogen strategy uh, by the end of the first half of uh, 2021. Um, the committee members are highly respected uh, academics, uh, experts, uh, practitioners, and uh, all of them acting uh, jointly. Uh, they will provide um, a multidimensional, multidisciplinary proposal that will act actually as an action plan for, uh, for the years to come. Uh, what is more important the strategy upon its approval um, is going to be incorporated in the updated version of uh, our national energy and climate plan. Uh, this means that it will be a fundamental 
cornerstone of our uh, long-term energy strategy, a binding uh, commitment of the Hellenic Republic to promote and support this technology. Um, and uh, our national uh, hydrogen strategy will entail um, a detailed uh, roadmap uh, of the emergence uh, for the emergence of, of a national hydrogen economy, uh, which will cover actually the whole hydrogen value chain. More specifically, this roadmap uh, will include and, and focus on a number of sub themes. Uh, first, the adaptation of uh, various hydrogen uh, systems and technologies. Second, carbon neutrality scenarios from uh, 2030 until 2050. Third, uh, the gradual development of a competitive hydrogen market um, that touches, as Minister said, uh, the upstream, midstream and downstream uh, sectors and expands also to several sectors of, of the Greek economy. Uh, fourth, uh, the development, of course, of the necessary regulatory and legal framework. And uh, fifth, um, I'm thinking, yes, a special roadmap of uh, targeted flagship investments that will uh, serve as a signal provider to investors that will provide added value and uh, job creation to, to local economies. Um, of course, it will also uh, and, uh, include uh, an innovation enabling scheme uh, that will aim to connect research uh, directly with the market to, to incubate and accelerate hydrogen uh, startups and uh, spin-offs, um, and of course, uh, finally, uh, a detailed engagement plan uh, in order to raise public awareness and uh, also provide educational and training material um, in order to create greater acceptability uh, through increased levels of uh, confidence in the technology. Um, but we also move from strategy to concrete uh, action. The Greek government, as you know, is a signatory party of the manifesto for the development of a, a European uh, hydrogen technologies and systems value chain. Um, we recently launched the Greek expression of uh, interest for uh, the important projects of common European interest. Uh, this is an interministerial effort. Uh, it is coordinated by the uh, together uh, between the Greek Ministry of Environment and Energy and the Ministry of Development and Investments in order to secure a national alignment in the development of our hydrogen uh, community. Um, I'm very proud, allow me to say, about the hard work that has been done uh, and uh, the results accomplished. Um, Mr. Skrek has said that we have more than 20 uh, proposals so far in this first call uh, for expression of interest. Um, the White Dragon project is um, among them a cluster project. Um, this joint effort between uh, our ministry, the Ministry of Development, uh, shipping, but also infrastructure and uh, transportation, uh, um, I think that this effort lays down the ground to attract uh, investments in the entire hydrogen uh, value chain. Uh, it will start, of course, with uh, hydrogen uh, generation, uh, but it will also catalyze progress in a number of other sectors. Um, more specifically, it will help to create hydrogen ready ports and ferries. Um, it will help to launch uh, hydrogen bus fleets. Uh, it will help uh, to convert heavy emitting industries to hydrogen uh, powered ones and also to embrace uh, innovative Greek startups and uh, spin-offs uh, to continue innovating at a global level, uh, such as in the production of electrolyzers uh, and others. And uh, here I take the opportunity to pay particular attention to, to a topic uh, that, uh, allow me to say, is very close to my heart, the, the decarbonization of the transportation uh, sector, the immobility, uh, you know, since the very beginning uh, of uh, Prime Minister Mitsotakis' administration, this government has prioritized uh, electric mobility. We managed to, to kickstart uh, this sector for Greece. 
and um, to have uh, very quickly some first tangible results and uh, drive a significant change. We passed last year the first immobility law in Greece uh, with tax and other financial incentives. We launched the first grant scheme uh, with up to seven euros uh, subsidy. Um, obviously, we have to do a lot more work to, to accelerate this transition to a green transport, but we also acknowledge that uh, future mobility may not rely uh, solely on uh, battery powered electric cars, but uh, hydrogen uh, propulsion using fuel cells or uh, the so-called e-fuels is, um, is a valid and uh, some say necessary also alternative. Um, so hydrogen alone or uh, hydrogen-based fuels like uh, same gas, like ammonia or methanol, um, they could be employed as uh, e-fuels for cars and especially uh, heavy duty trucks um, in, a, in a short or even medium term, but also ships and planes uh, in the longer term. I'm aware uh, here that the Greek, uh, that the German uh, Federal Transportation Ministry puts um, a special emphasis on, uh, on promoting the use of hydrogen in cars um, and will soon launch uh, a new hydrogen technology innovation and technology center uh, as part of the German national hydrogen strategy. Uh, 1.6 billion, I think, from the Ministry of uh, Transport. Um, and I need to, uh, to agree with Minister Scheuer here that uh, hydrogen, uh, you know, is not the, the champagne of the energy transition, but it's the table water. Um, we just need to build scales and uh, drive the cost further down. So to conclude, um, hydrogen is, of course, a strategic priority uh, for our energy transition. It's one of the leading uh, options for uh, storing energy and uh, also enabling the, the integration of variable renewables in the Greek energy mix, especially on green hydrogen. We support the EU goal uh, of installing at least six gigawatt of renewable uh, hydrogen electrolyzers in the EU by 2024 and uh, 40 gigawatt of renewable hydrogen by 2030 and uh, we will try to follow the, the proportionality principle. Uh, and uh, finally, since um, I'm currently located here in the middle of the Aegean Sea, because I'm in Astipalea, uh, you know, this Greek-German cooperation to make this island uh, green, uh, smart and sustainable. Uh, I think that it's worth mentioning that hydrogen's modular nature and uh, fuel cell technologies allow uh, also the implementation of hydrogen systems in decentralized applications in Greece, uh, you know, despite our ambitious strategy to complete by 2030 the interconnection of large islands and um, island com uh, complexes with, uh, with the mainland electricity grid. So a limited number of smaller islands will probably remain disconnected from the main green grid. So for these cases, hydrogen technologies could be suitable to help uh, islands generate their own sustainable low-cost energy with the installation perhaps of renewable hybrid uh, plants uh, while also serving as a fuel uh, carrier for other energy uses. So to sum up, uh, Greece has committed to decarbonize the electricity production, to develop solar and wind power as the backbone uh, of its energy system, but in this context uh, renewable hydrogen production can help uh, to further utilize our uh, substantial uh, unharvested uh, renewable energy sources to bring about the energy transition more quickly and securely. This is also reflected in the principles of our uh, recently submitted uh, Greek Economic Recovery and Resilience Plan, calling for a greener, uh, more digital, more resilient Europe uh, and it will put some green fuel uh, in the engines uh, of our ambitious uh, front-loaded NECP. Um, so during uh, the, the fourth round of the Greek-German uh, consultations held uh, last December, our two countries 
reaffirmed their strong uh, commitment to continue working together in order to further enhance um, our bilateral relations and uh, practical cooperations at all fields. And uh, uh, I therefore, um, you know, invite the two governments and, of course, the private sector to seize this opportunity and make the most uh, out of it. So thank you very much uh, once again and congratulations for today's workshop. Thank you very much, Mrs. Suduku, for this bright uh, insights of what the steps that, that has been taken already and the steps that are uh, to be followed. And it is indeed very fascinating to listen to your um, explanation and the milestones that your ministry and your department has reached. So thank you very much. And we know that you're basically on your way to the airport. Um, so thank you also for making it a possible. Actually, to... yes, I apologize, but uh, in 30 minutes is the flight and I have to run <laughs> yes. to the airport. So thank Thanks you. you. Thank you very much. And then we will uh, turn to the perspective and the national strategy of Germany. And um, uh, therefore, I would like to ask Mr. Banterbush on stage um, following positions in the Economic Affairs Ministry, the Federal Chancellery, the International Energy Agency in Paris, but also as Director of the German Energy Agency, Zadena, you are now serving as Deputy Director General in the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy. And your portfolio includes not only energy efficiency, gaseous energy carriers, but also heat networks. And we are therefore very honored to have you here and to learn more about the hydrogen and, and Davis and developments in Germany, uh, strategic, regulatory, but also policy-wise. So thank you, Mr. Banderbush. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, and a warm welcome. And uh, I would like to uh, thank all participants who have uh, are with us right now. Uh, dear Excellency, dear Minister, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, inform you about the state of play of our uh, hydrogen strategy, which the government has uh, approved almost a year ago. I think it's not an exaggeration to say that there hasn't been an energy dossier that has developed its speed in such a short time with such a momentum as the hydrogen dossier. If I look back two years ago where we stood with our first deliberations, what role gases need to play in the energy transition and where we are today, not only in Germany, not only in the European Union, but globally, it's really uh, amazing to see what has happened. Um, it goes without saying that uh, the that hydrogen is a necessary element, a big element to reach climate neutrality in 2050. And it goes also without saying that the motivation now to push hydrogen is not just for climate change reasons. That's of course a very, very big motivation and incentive, but their stakes are also very high when it comes to global competitiveness, industrial policies of the future, markets that are developing, and Europe, the European Union, and Germany, we are all keen to invest as soon as possible to make sure that we don't miss out this global chance. Um, it is very important to underscore from a German context that today we are importing more than 80 up to 90 percent of all of our energy. That's really, really a lot. And we have clearly marked out in our strategy that the imports of renewable energies and in particular hydrogen is a crucial element for the German decarbonization process and the ultimate objective to reach climate, uh, climate neutrality uh, in, as we said, 2050. But tomorrow the government will probably decide in, in our cabinet that the new target is climate neutrality by 2045. This means 
that we will need more hydrogen at a more rapid pace as was foreseen because in addition of course the government will raise the objective of co2 emission reduction to 65 percent also by 2030 in the meeting upcoming tomorrow now what are the objectives of our hydrogen strategy the first quantitative objective is that we want to produce five gigawatt electrolyzers capacity um, by 2030 on German soil. This at the first glance may sound not too ambitious, but if you uh, assume that this is really renewable uh, hydrogen, green hydrogen based on renewable electricity, then on German soil under our uh, uh, resource endowment restrictions, it is really an ambitious target. And um, I would like to uh, now highlight a couple of points that uh, we focus right now when it comes to the implementation of our strategy. In general, implementation is done by the different line ministries. Uh, my ministry does play a crucial role when it comes to electrolyzers, uh, so um, production of green hydrogen when it comes to the infrastructure question and use in particular industry. We have our transport ministry who is working on all the applications and usages in uh, uh, transport and of course uh, the ministry of um, research and development is a lot focusing on these questions research and development and investing also a lot of euros we are happy to say that uh, last summer the government provided uh, in total nine billion euros for hydrogen projects seven so-called for national or european projects and two for international global projects that puts us now in a position really to uh, work on a large range of projects and uh, i would like to uh, highlight here first and foremost our ipsi engagement where we are now in the process of selecting uh, the german projects we have uh, received a huge interest which is really really uh, amazing uh, when we uh, draw the line after our call for proposals uh, we we got 230 proposals from our industry medium scale industry but also big companies of course global players and they the projects sum up to an investment volume of 140 billion euros and the support they ask for is round about 44 billion that is, of course, much too much. Uh, and we cannot, of course, uh, uh, give uh, support to all of these projects. But the sheer numbers show not only the interest of industries and business guys in hydrogen, it also shows that these companies believe in hydrogen and it shows the preparedness of gap of um, business to invest and that shows that we are right when we say that hydrogen is a must is imperative for a climate friendly future uh, and businesses have understood that because if you look into the different sectors be it chemical industries be it steel um, they cannot decarbonize without the use of hydrogen Everybody has understood that now, and therefore they are all keen now to not, out, not miss our chances to invest. Um, we will reduce, of course, now the number of proposals. We are in the internal pro process of, uh, of uh, selection. Of course, we have discussions with our federal states, and uh, I hope that by the end of uh, May, early June, we can start the matchmaking process at European level. And we do hope that uh, finally, by the end of this year, early next year, that you know we are through with the administrative procedures and that the projects can get the green light for investment. But what I would like to uh, point out also in, in, at, at this opportunity, that when it comes to projects and their implementation, there are two crucial things, or let me say three crucial things. The first thing is 
At the beginning, you need integrated projects. You cannot just build an electrolyzer and uh, he's producing, it is producing um, green hydrogen. No, you need a transport line or trailer or pipeline, and you need to have an idea in which sector, in which application the hydrogen is going to be used. So this idea of integrated projects is a must in the process of the ramp up of the market. Otherwise, it, it will not work. Um, the second dimension is that, of course, because of cost digression necessities, you need support schemes. And these support schemes must comprise capital expenditure, investment support, and in a range of cases, also operating cost support, which is critical when it comes to state aid rules in Brussels, as you know. And the third point, which is also very crucial, uh, is the right regulation. So support schemes and regulation need to work hand in hand. If that doesn't work, if that all these, bit, these pieces don't fit together, final investment decisions from companies will not come. I give you now a couple of examples as regards the regulation, because these are challenges that you face not only at national level, but all member countries face these challenges also at European level. In the German context, for example, we need to reduce for uh, the EEG surcharge, and that is a must. With this, we are now in Parliament, and I think we have that uh, under control, so to speak, but the regulation is a must. We need to cut down costs, and the EEG surcharge, the church charge that the Germans have on renewable electricity to finance uh, the production of renewable electricity needs to be exempted. In Brussels, um, we, we have, uh, of course, a regulation called Red 2 from the transport sector, as you know, and we have implemented that regulation in a very progressive manner. So by 2030, in the transport sector, Germany should have 28% uh, of renewable energies be it biogas, be it hydrogen, uh, and other sources, that you know, synthetic fuels, for example, and all reduce the uh, CO2 use in the transport sector. Because it is obvious that electrification alone cannot do the job, we will have a broad range of combustion engines on the, on the streets still 2030, maybe later as well, and therefore, we need this kind of reduction. But in this context, now the European Union comes into play because the Commission now has the task to develop a so-called delegate act to uh, make sure that in the transport sector, the, the, if hydrogen is used, it is really green hydrogen. So the question is, under which circumstances does green electricity allow for the production of green hydrogen? I don't want to go into the details here of this regulation. That goes a bit too far. But uh, we have, uh, uh, let's say, uh, received a draft of this delegated act. And uh, uh, from that, we can see that the deliberations in the Commission at this point in time give only under very, very restricted circumstances um, the, the possibility to use green electricity for the ramp up of hydrogen uh, in the transport market. This really, really frightens us, so to speak, because it, uh, the transport sector must be the leading sector in the ramp up of the market, because in this sector, people are prepared to hi pay higher prices much more easily than in other sectors. So with that, uh, I, I uh, would like to, uh, uh, underscore that we all need to work together to convince the Commission that we need much more flexibility in the first years when it comes to the implementation of the first projects. Otherwise, uh, Europe will fall behind its competitors, be it Japan, be it China, be it the US. That's for sure. So um, with that, I, I would like to uh, extend a couple of uh, deliberations to the international uh, 
concepts that we have to um, promote the production of, of hydrogen uh, outside our country. Uh, we are working on a, on a scheme, uh, H2 Global, and the idea is that uh, we organize uh, a market, a small market, so to speak, where we uh, offer tenders for the production of uh, green uh, hydrogen or its derivatives that the German, uh, in Germany a foundation will, will buy. And that foundation will then sell the respective energies, green energies, to the German market. And of course, the cost difference is to be financed via state support. But we want to give also countries outside of Europe an opportunity now to develop markets and to start producing uh, green uh, hydrogen or the respective deriv derivatives to be transported to our markets. Because all this needs time. And by 2030, we have to have this market developed, be it import in Europe, be it exchange in Europe, or be uh, imports outside of Europe, because we are deeply convinced that hydrogen will play uh, a key role uh, for our energy future. With the last word on the so-called colors, I would like to conclude, because um, Germany stands for green hydrogen at first place, but uh, we acknowledge that, uh, of course, um, in particular, blue hydrogen will be needed also in a transi transition phase. That is absolutely necessary because uh, the degression of cost with green hydrogen is probably a, will be probably a little bit lower. But in the end, that needs to be decided by the market, not by governments. But we have to have the door open also for other, color, other colors. With that, I would like to hand back and thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to um, present to you where Germany stands with implementation of uh, our hydrogen strategy. Many thanks. Thank you, Mr. Benterbusch. And if you allow, I would directly jump into the question and discussion round. Um, I have not yet received any from the uh, participants, but please hear the invitation again to send us any question if you wish. But I have uh, two or three questions I would like to, to raise if you allow. You have sure. mentioned uh, you have mentioned the support schemes that Germany is introducing. Uh, you've mentioned H2 Global, um, but there's also the H2 funding guidelines. Um, so when we look at these schemes, how could, it, how could they also become relevant in the cooperation with Greece? Well, I think the first uh, uh, thing is that with Greece and other European countries, we cooperate uh, under the framework of the uh, IPCEI projects. Uh, and normally the German government does not uh, support directly investment in other European partner countries. That has to do also with state uh, aid control. And of course, uh, the, normal, um, the normal way is that this is done by the Greek government. But as this workshop shows, we need to cooperate, design projects, develop ideas, how we can cooperate because we need also a, a European um, infrastructure when it comes to hydrogen, because pipeline transport will be much more cheaper and reliable uh, when it comes to hydrogen than, than by ship. Uh, it's made mostly the derivatives where we are clear how to transport them, but um, the energy losses when it comes to the transport of, of really hydrogen are still very, very high. And I mean, Japan, as we all know, is now uh, trying to uh, collect experiences with the transport of hydrogen. Um, but that is something where I think we need to cooperate. And the, the IPCEI uh, framework, I think, is, is ideal on this. Thank you very much, Mr. Banterbush. And if we look at the, um, the value chain of producing hydrogen, there is also the German industry which has experience. Is there any part of the value chain where you think that the German industry can really offer their support and, uh, and experience? Well, I do think that uh, the German industry has ample opportunity to cooperate with Greek partners. 
uh, we need fuel cell production all over Europe. And um, the, the resource endowment uh, of, of Greece with renewable energy is much better than in Germany. And uh, therefore, production sites of, of hydrogen, they are probably also in the south, uh, and in particular in, in the Mediterranean region. So uh, I do believe that our, our uh, companies uh, are really reaching out to our uh, Greek counterparts in order to look out uh, for opportunities. I'm uh, very much aware uh, of, of uh, the Portuguese and, and Spanish activities, and I welcome very much this workshop because we should also uh, have a clear view that uh, Greece has a strategically very well located uh, area for you know, uh, cooperation with Germany uh, or other countries like Austria you know, uh, on hydrogen because the pipeline uh, a, a pipeline um, uh, trajectory is not too far away. It's absolutely okay, in particular for the south of Germany, for example. Thank you, Mr. Bentebush. I would just, uh, as a final question, pick up a question from the audience, which is synthetic fuels are a very efficient way to store green energy. And how do you assess the chances that this path will be followed? Well, I, I, I think that, of course, in the end, it's decided in the transport sector. It's clear, for example, when it comes to aviation, uh, we will need uh, synthetic kerosene. And, of course, we will also need synthetic fuels when it comes to lorries. That seems to be quite certain, uh, because batteries, at least at this point in time of technological development, can do the job when it comes to long distances and, and heavy load. Uh, in the car sector, I think it, it's, still deep, it, it's still open. I personally do believe that hydrogen will also play here a role, not in the mass market, not for small cars, not in big cities, but in the premium market, I'm pretty sure uh, the, the comfort that goes with uh, uh, a hydrogen car will be highly appreciated. But uh, that is something that markets need to decide uh, and the users. Uh, but there will certainly be also users that, that go for hydrogen cars. Uh, but we should not forget uh, that, of course, every kilowatt hour of electricity needs to be transformed into hydrogen. And there are, of course, losses that one needs to take into account. But um, that is something where I think the governments must have, you know, uh, the technology, the door open for different technological developments and should not, via subsidy schemes or regulation, uh, pave uh, 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 a way in one or another direction. It needs to be an open technological development. All right. So thank you very much, Mr. Banterbush, for this excellent insight into the German strategies and priorities at this point. And then I would like to switch to the next session um, and introduce you the next session of today, which is on the perspectives for the use of green hydrogen in Germany and Greece. And in the first part, we will look into hydrogen as a key element in the energy transition. So we will concentrate a bit more on the production side first. And for that, uh, we have the pleasure to have Professor Kapros here, and he will give us a short presentation on the role of hydrogen in the energy system of the future. Professor Karpros uh, is not only chairman of the Greek Commission for Hydrogen, but also professor of energy economics and operational research at the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering of the National Technical University of Athens. And Professor Kapros, with your vast mathematical modeling experience, you were, amongst others, also involved in the latest long-term scenarios 2050 for energy and climate, in which you have also considered hydrogen. And we are very much curious to learn from your insights within the next 15 minutes. So welcome, Professor Kapros. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity and the invitation. It is a great pleasure. Um, it is uh, true that uh, the exploration of uh, hydrogen in uh, the future of transition towards climate neutrality is uh, a very important uh, element. And uh, it is true that it requires uh, 
considerable uh, analysis. So I will show my few slides here. I hope they are visible. Okay. Yes, they're visible. And uh, you know, the word uh, climate neutrality, which is now in the law of Europe. So it's extremely important that we are, we have the binding now targets to reach climate neutrality in Europe is at the same time a very ambitious target because it implies the net phase out of all greenhouse gas emissions, the net zero CO2 emissions, which implies that practically all sectors, all sectors have to phase out the use of fossil fuels uh, for the large majority of them. The European uh, strategy is uh, common to all countries now, uh, thanks uh, to the governance uh, procedure, which is followed very, um, I think, constructively right now, and has three pillars, the energy efficiency, the renewables, and the carbon pricing. The new targets, 55% greenhouse gas emissions reduction in 2030, and then the net zero greenhouse gas emissions in 2050 are very demanding and the transition is practically based on strong energy efficiency and a very very large share of renewables especially in the electricity sector uh, in 2030 and then continuously until 2050. The, the storyline of the roadmap, which has been agreed and supported by the mathematical modeling that uh, we are doing and many others are doing, uh, there is, a, so to say, a, an agreement about uh, this view of the roadmap today in, in the analysis uh, field. So it says, uh, decarbonize the power generation, mainly with renewables and storage, as soon as possible to allow electricity becoming a zero carbon carrier and electrify transport and heat again as much as possible. But however, this electrification cannot be 100%. So there is a room to produce uh, climate neutral fuels. And there we have uh, the possibility of using biomass, but the potential is limited and uh, there is the role of hydrogen produced from renewables to be climate neutral and use hydrogen directly in a number of applications, but also together with CO2 from biogenic and air capture origin, produce uh, clean synthetic hydrocarbons and methane, which will uh, replace the fossil fuels in those sectors where electrification is not possible. And uh, in this transition, if we ever use uh, some fossil fuels, this will require underground storage of carbon dioxide, which uh, is uh, a difficult issue right now in uh, most European countries. And uh, the issue, an important issue here in this roadmap is uh, that uh, this transformation process implies uh, uh, very high increase of electricity consumption, electricity production, which may challenge the total volume of renewables. And for this reason, optimizing overall efficiency is very important. And at the same time, limiting the requirement for synthetic hydrogen-based fuels and hydrogen as much as possible in those sectors that is absolutely necessary to do. Uh, this uh, greening of, uh, of fuels. So it is a combined roadmap, uh, which uh, has a, an overall agreement right now. And it is uh, further applied to the Green Deal strategy and the forthcoming legislation in the European Union. So uh, if we see now the technologies for this uh, transformation of uh, the fossil fuels uh, from uh, being fossil to green, uh, 
we have a central law central of hydrogen. Hydrogen, as you know, can be produced uh, as green, gray, blue, turquoise, but uh, in, in the long term, only green and turquoise are climate neutral. The blue hydrogen is also low uh, emission hydrogen, however, requires the carbon capture and underground storage. And then the methanation and the various uh, chemical routes to produce uh, synthetic hydrocarbons require CO2. And CO2 from capturing from uh, fossil fuels or industrial process emissions is possible, but it is not a climate neutral in the long run. And so the technologies capturing CO2 from the air and the biomass are necessary to obtain uh, a fully climate neutral methane and, uh, and uh, hydrocarbons. And then we go to the three distribution systems, hydrogen, gas, and liquids. And the gas distribution has uh, also the possibilities to blend hydrogen to a certain extent and biogas, again, to a certain extent, depending on the potential, as well as uh, the liquids distribution can also blend uh, uh, biofuels, which, however, is also limited by the potential. So this uh, uh, simple scheme is uh, the uh, representative of the of the, of the um, system of the future. Uh, regarding the technology readiness, uh, methanation, the methan route, the fissure drops, all these are known technologies, but industrial maturity is not yet reached. CO2 capture from the air is probably one of the key technologies of the future, but still very immature and uncertain. The biogenic CO2 and the, bi the biomass, the bioeconomy chains are also mature, require further industrial scale, but uh, are uh, of course limited by potential. The hydrogen distribution is feasible, but requires significant investment. The green gas blending is feasible in the short term, and uh, however, regulation and incentives are needed. So uh, the economic readiness is uh, probably the key obstacle in, in this process, because uh, the blue hydrogen uh, is, uh, can be competitive but is limited to niche markets for the reasons that I mentioned, while the gray hydrogen is not an option in this process. So the green hydrogen mainly depends on electricity costs. However, it helps the power system to reduce balancing costs and maximize the use of renewables. So in a well-functioning market and system, green hydrogen can profit from uh, uh, cheap uh, renewable electricity, which otherwise will be probably curtailed. And this may be an opportunity to have competitive costs of electricity in the production of green hydrogen. At the same time, the technology progress expected from green hydrogen may uh, make uh, hydrogen competitive in the medium term. The, uh, the synthetic hydrogen are expensive today uh, firstly, because of the cost of hydrogen, but also because of the lack of climate natural carbon dioxide. So here, there is a significant technology progress to make to reduce through the learning process, uh, the CO2 uh, capturing technologies. And of course, uh, the uh, industrial scale production of the synthetic hydrogen, hydrocarbons and methane. So the, today it is important that uh, uh, projects, investment and, and pilots develop as much as possible to enable the route of learning by doing and industrial scale maturity, because these are required as soon as possible to enable the transition towards hydrogen and synthetic fuels. Now, if, if we see in a, in a more closely a roadmap for uh, the shorter term until 2030 and a little bit after 2030. Uh, our views, uh, uh, in our views, we have uh, 
in fact, uh, three instruments. We have the demand pusher strategy, the infrastructure priorities, and the economic incentives. The demand pusher strategies, for example, heavy duty vehicles running on hydrogen are feasible and can be competitive. The quotas in gas blending can enable already the first steps in uh, small quantities blended in uh, gas distribution together with biogas. And uh, a few uh, uh, and the first steps in the production of synthetic liquids for aviation and maritime where alternative options are very limited and difficult. So these three are probably priorities in the demand push strategy in the short medium term. The infrastructure priorities, we are talking about uh, probably a strategy in the first, uh, as a first priority towards refueling hubs for industry, for heavy duty vehicles, for ports, and uh, generally large scale refueling. The technologies of storage, compression and liquefaction are very important to that respect. And then later, much later, come the development of distribution networks and, uh, uh, and, and then uh, large scale industrial applications in selected sectors. So the, in, in the short medium term, what are important are the demonstration plans, the subsidies for vehicle purchasing costs, the quotas for blending, and uh, also to develop uh, the greening of the gas market through uh, subsidization in an analogy to the feed-in tariffs in the, for renewables in the power sector to eligible bilateral gas supply contracts with, which uh, include green gases and hydrogen. So this is illustrated here in this uh, picture of a roadmap. Uh, it shows a very uh, in very concrete terms, uh, that uh, the bioenergy components are important to combine with hydrogen due to limited uh, feedstock potential. Uh, they, they are competitive, but they, they do not uh, solve the problem. And then give the room to the, uh, the first steps of the hydrogen development. You see the, the fueling hubs, the development of green hydrogen, the uh, a few electric industrial applications, the heavy duty hydrogen, etc., and the synthetic hydrogen feeding aviation and maritime. One of the key instruments is the concept of the RMFNBO, the renewable fuels of non biological origin. The analysis uh, that we have participated in uh, shows uh, that uh, the RMFNBO can be an instrument for subsidies also for uh, guarantees of origin, for trading certificates, and uh, so for a, a way of uh, enriching the, um, uh, the way of achieving the renewable shares. And, and this probably will be uh, mirrored in the forthcoming RED3 directive. And I'm finishing with this uh, slide showing for Greece uh, uh, the scenarios uh, uh, one of the scenarios that has been developed very recently for the EU hydrogen strategy and the RED3 uh, developments and impact assessment uh, using the PRIMES model. Uh, it shows uh, that uh, in this context, with of course uh, uh, significant pol uh, public policy support, it is possible to get uh, in Greece uh, uh, a little above 500 megawatts of uh, electrolyzers based on uh, to produce green hydrogen and this should be expected to, that uh, increases very considerably in the future you see an input electricity to hydrogen estimated to be until 2030 3.7 terawatt hour can even be ah, okay uh, 90 terawatt hours in the future to produce the synthetic methane and uh, and, and fuels and uh, you see the priorities for buses, for cars and heavy duty vehicles, some uh, demonstration and pilot projects for trains and ships. So there is a focus on the transport sector, of course, together with a few industrial applications in refineries, in uh, a, a few 
uh, industrial sectors, mainly chemicals. Greece uh, has no blast furnace steel production, and so has not the possibility to apply hydrogen as uh, a reduction of iron ore. Uh, and uh, then the important component of uh, input of hydrogen to the production of clean fuels uh, addressing the crucial sectors of maritime and aviation. So this is very tentative, of course, don't take it to the letter, but illustrates the uh, way of our uh, modeling and projection into the future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Capros, for this very insightful, broad and especially also exclusive perspective. Uh, we will pick up uh, the questions later on on the subsequent discussion. Um, you have uh, definitely given a very well generic overall idea of the role that hydrogen can play globally or in Europe, uh, but also uh, the projections for Greece and why it has become a main pillar for the energy transition as well. And um, now I would like to bring in our next uh, speaker on the on the uh, on the stage. Um, we would like to zoom in on the German and European experiences now. Um, actually, I had Mr. Diewald here, but probably Mrs. Yes, <laughs> Mr. Diewald here for uh, our next speaker slot. Um, and we are happy that you have uh, accepted the invitation to present on the experiences with the production of green hydrogen in Germany and the option for a European exchange with renewable energy. And Mr. Diewald is the speaker of the board of the association, the German Association for Hydrogen and Fuel Cells, but also spokesman of the Think Tank Performing energy and a member of the board of European Hydrogen Association. So uh, you've been also very much um, uh, involved in the H2 Global instrument and scheme that was presented earlier by Mr. Benterbush. So we're happy to have you here. Warm welcome to you, Mr. Diewald. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. And good morning, Mr. Sikas. Good morning, Mr. Kilimes, good morning, Mr. Rachel, good morning, Mr. Reichel, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the opportunity to, um, to present uh, the, the activities in hydrogen in Germany, but also perhaps I'll give you a short vision um, of our expectations, how we can develop the hydrogen in the next years and bring it in the market. So the German Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Association is now more well, in this year, 25 years acting uh, to, to integrate the green hydrogen um, energy carrier in the, in the market. And uh, we really work, you mentioned out in the Commission Performing Energy um, Task Force, the first or create, try to create the first market design and uh, the, the people or the uh, Mr. Mr. Katros mentioned a little bit about the refineries. We find it in, in the refinery sector that there's a possibility to, to integrate really green hydrogen very early because it's now on the, on the price leveling like biofuels. So the reduction cost uh, uh, to, uh, of the green ga uh, greenhouse gas emissions are on the same level. And we think that is the first step, but of course in the future, the fuel cells mobility sector is one of the uh, huge markets and also the, the steel uh, industry is also, uh, uh, they have a huge demand in the chemical industry and, and so on. Uh, so you see here a short overview of our members and I think this picture make it very visible. It's not only a story for the green electricity guys or for the common factors. So all the sectors are, be met by this energy transition and, and all the, the uh, industry sectors so, uh, search for solutions, how we, they can operate and work in a defossilized uh, world latest in 2050. It seems now that it will become perhaps a little bit earlier. So it's, it's a common factors, it's steel, it's energy sectors, it's uh, really the, the chemical industry, everybody is involved or has uh, some, uh, uh, conflicts or uh, some challenge which they have to solve in the next years. Um, 
to go forward. I think that was one reason why we, uh, our government works on the German national hydrogen strategy since two years and uh, they, they presented in exactly one year ago. Um, and so they understood that is not only a small area of our energy but or of our economic uh, uh yeah economic it's it's more so everything is inflected through this transition and uh, hydrogen will play a huge role um to to get uh, to secure our energy supply economic but also our industry in our country and of course there's a big question, where come the energy of tomorrow? It was very, very soon, very clear that Germans are not are really able uh, to produce enough renewable energy in their own country. So we have to import, I'll come a little bit later on it. Um, but for that, the question was there, what is the energy carrier? And also they look on the, on the, on the, on the figures, which come all, out of all the studies around the world. And that was very clear it was very soon clear that this hydrogen business will be a huge opportunity for the industry, not only for Germany, I come later to it. I think it's a really a huge opportunity for the European Union. So what, what said the hydrogen uh, strategy? First, I think that was for the industry, uh, the best information it gives a, a funding of 9 billion euros uh, will be offered for 38 coordinate measures um and especially so it's it was for 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 the transport sector a lot of money but also for import and of course to to build up electrolyzer uh, capacity in germany um and we try now to find a solution how we can operate it in an economic style we have a lot of experience i think the first electrolyzers was installed wind electro wind or a combination of wind and electrolyzer was installed in 2010 and now we have over 60 power to hydrogen projects, which be in operation. But of course, it's the more research of, uh, uh, projects and not really economic uh, projects. Another thing what they mentioned out, or they, we expect now that the um, hydrogen or the government expect that the hydrogen demand will be um, double in 2030. So we will be increased from 55 terawatt hours to 110 uh, uh, terawatt hours. There are a lot of experts uh, have another opinion. They believe that it's more than 150 to 200 terawatt hours uh, to 2030. But that shows that there is really a huge challenge and how we can really produce enough green hydrogen to, to fulfill these targets. Um, Germany mentioned out also that we will install five gigawatt in, in Germany of electrolyzer that depends that we have not really enough renewable energies and we need, of course, it's more efficiency to use uh, the energy or the green electricity directly and not to convert it in uh, hydrogen. But we see in the long term, we need this opportunity. And so one target is to install five uh, terawatt hours, but they can only produce 14 terawatt, uh, sorry, five gigawatt, and they can only produce 14 terawatt hours. So that means that we have to import 41 terawatt hour or around 50 gigawatt of electrolyzer capacity uh, in 2030 latest. So it was clear or it was um, on the hand that the government said, so how we can create really import market and they uh, mentioned our 2 billion euros for international hydrogen partnerships. And the focus, uh, Mr. Benta Bush mentioned out, it, it's on green hydrogen. So the future is really in green hydrogen. I, I know there's a big discussion. We need perhaps before blue hydrogen, which will convert out from, from uh, natural gas. Uh, the reason should be that the green hydrogen uh, produ production capacity is not really, well, it's not possible to, to increase the production capacity so soon. I have a complete other option to that, uh, opinion to that. I think it's more easy to install more renewable energies around the world and produce green hydrogen. It's very easy. You see the big numbers of increasing in the last 10 years. So I think we need a, a little bit more confidential uh, in our engineer possibilities. So I want now to show where's the perspective for the European Union and the global union. 
uh, uh, global uh, market. In the, uh, in the moment, we have a needing of uh, energy around 2,500 terawatt hours. There are a lot of opinions that we can reduce it to 1,000 terawatt hours, but uh, the, the reality shows in the last years by all efficiency activities that we not really reduce our consumption of energy. So if we expect really 2,000 terawatt hours, that means uh, around 25% reduction. And if you look now how many re uh, renewables we have in the moment, it's around 120 gigawatt. And we see the acceptance discussion in Germany. So if we can increase it three times so that we reach 300 gigawatts, we can produce around 700 terawatt hours. But that means that we can maximum produce our electricity consumption in the moment and directly using of electricity the consumption is the best one, it's the most efficiency solutions. But that means on the other side, all additional uh, defossilized energy consumptions must be imported. And that is uh, also uh, guilty for the transport sector, for the steel sector, for the chemical sectors. And so it's really the best solution to use directly hydrogen in few cell cars, in few cell op opportunities. It's not only if you have only to look on one device, of course, it's not the most efficiency uh, uh, solution, but if you look on the system, then it seems so that hydrogen is really the most efficiency solution. So we expect more, and that is uh, results of really uh, big um, research um, institutes and we expect in 2030 a demand of 150 terawatt hours and in the mobility sector around 100 terawatt hours. And of course, we mentioned out, we can only produce 14 terawatt hours uh, in Germany we have to import. And the first activities are already to import it from outside of the European Union, but that is only depending a little bit on the, on the household, um, um, decisions, uh, what uh, was uh, done before. Um, so we have now 1 billion euro for this H2 Global program. But why I mentioned out this, or uh, I explained you the H2 Global program. We developed it, uh, and it's really an OPEX of, um, supporting program or a subsidy program for green hydrogen production. And of course, we, uh, in the moment, we use it really for import green hydrogen from outside of the European Union. But this system is really in line with the European regulations, and you can use it for the home production. You can use it for European imports or trading between the European countries. It's really complete in line with the European Union regulations. And I think there is really the second solutions where we can use this H2 global concept or the H2 European or whatever you mentioned about, but this concept is really uh, a solution to bring very soon green hydrogen production in a business case before we get the big regulations. And I expect that we will get it in the next 10 years, but we, haven't, we have no time to wait because all the other countries around the world, especially China, Japan, or the Koreans are really work on developing technology solutions. So we are in a global competition and we have now to act now. We have now to start the business. And I think on the other side, we have to fulfill our climate targets. And so I think there's really a possibility to bring climate targets and economic increasing together. So how it works, we, we make an option to buy green hydrogen over 10 years. And then this immediate year, which is in the middle, sell it to, to the market again and make an auction to, to, for the demand. And of course, if we have no regulation, there is a big gap between green hydrogen and the selling or the, the price which the, the um, yeah, energy user will be pay if there's no regulation for green. They pay only the fossil price, so it means perhaps for green hydrogen we, or for hydrogen, if you compare it in the moment, the green hydrogen, uh, not the green, sorry, the fossil hydrogen price is around 150, and the green hydrogen price is by around five, uh, five euros, so there is a gap between 3.5 euros uh, per kilogram. And this program uh, has the opportunity or the, the possibility 
to cover this price so that you can really operate uh, your green hydrogen production in an economic style. Uh, I jump over. So what it means for the European Union, of course, we can import it from the Australia, from Argentina, wherever around the world. But is it really clever if you have a long view on it uh, and you develop a strategy? It's clear that pipeline transport is the cheapest possibility to import energy or to transport energy and store it at the same time. So, of course, you can transport it with a chip, hydrogen, ammonia, methanol, or whatever. And you can produce it very cheaply in uh, Australia, for example, but the transport is very uh, cost intensive. And if you compare it with the possible uh, or with the production prices in the European Union or around the European Union and combine it with the transport price so that it is cheaper than hydrogen from Argentina or from Australia. And on the other side, all this pipeline transport, which comes around the European Union, has one benefit also. All these pipes go to our countries in the south of Europe or in the southeastern of Europe. And so it means also integration of these countries uh, also, because to fulfill a, a pipe, you need a lot of hydrogen. So you can produce, for example, in North Africa, hydrogen, then it will become over Spain or over Italy, and they can produce hydrogen additionality. And in the end, the pipe is full and it makes, or they have a economic operation transport of green hydrogen through these pipes. And that is also guilty for, the, for, for Greece, for Bulgaria, and I think they can operate together. And I think that is really a big, big solution um, to, to create a new feeling for, for the European Union, to say we share our money with the, the areas of uh, a big demand or a big offer of, of sun and wind. And so it brings perhaps uh, the, uh, the European Union together. If you look to Greece, especially, I think uh, Mr. Kapros mentioned it out, uh, the refineries were two uh, targets which we have to fulfill. So if you create a H2 Greece program and you get some financing from the European Union, I think it will be hard really to, to fulfill your targets in the refineries. Um, to 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 fulfill the or to to to, uh, to to meet the targets of uh, renewable energy in the fuel sector, and also you can create an export of your wind and uh, PV uh, uh, yeah, demand, uh, not an uh, offer. Uh, so green hydrogen gives suddenly the wind and the sun an economic value, and you can sell it to the richer countries in the European Union. And I think that is basic for a new feeling of European Union. And um, I hope that the, the that, that will be, this idea will be a little bit more in the heads of all the actors around in, in Brussels, that it's not only in an energy story, it's also a European Union story. So if we have a look on 2050, uh, Mr. Eitmeier mentioned it out, uh, green hydrogen is the crude oil of tomorrow. Okay, I agree, if you see on the, the fossilized uh, world. But then, please have a look, the share of crude oil of the total world trade is uh, more than 2,000 2, billion US dollars, or more than 12% of the world trade trading. And I think that number shows which opportunity is on the table which we have in the moment. If we act now, we can organize that this, uh, or a lot of this uh, big trading uh, money will be go over the European Union and uh, will be produced in the European Union. And we can sell it, or we can sell the technologies around the world for that. And we can reduce our imports from, uh, from the Russians, from, from Arabic, from, from America, so we can really produce it in the European Union and around the European Union. And so I think that will be the solutions for a strong region um, and for a fair world. Thank you very much for your, um, your to hearing my words and I'm really uh, happy to, to get some questions from your side. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Divad, for these insights. Also, adding on what Mr. Bantabush has presented on the experiences in Germany and also your personal uh, and and um, institutional perspective on the on the numbers, which is also very interesting to see um, the optimistic uh, version or the optimistic numbers here as well. Um, Mrs. Dr. Kirsten Westphal, I would like to continue with you now. Um, we are happy to discuss with you on the role of the Mediterranean for scaling up a European market for carbon neutral hydrogen. And uh, Mrs. Kirsten Westphal is, is assigned for international energy relations and global energy security at the German Institute for International and Security Affairs in Berlin, which provides analysis on foreign policy issues. And Dr. Westphal is also a member of the German Hydrogen Council and has been involved in various publications already on the geopolitics of the energy transformation on national and European level. So we are flattered that you made it possible to participate here. Thank you, Mrs. Westphal, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so very much for your kind words. Um, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I will also start with a short presentation and um, share my screen right now. I hope you can see it. Yeah. But I have to go back. Um, indeed, um, as it has been said, I'm coming from a geopolitical, foreign and security policy angle. And I can build very much on what Mr. Diewald has said in previous speakers. Um, I will start with stating the obvious that um, the role of the Mediterranean is clear if you look really to yeah, the meteorological, but also geographical conditions. You can even see that from this map that you have certain really sweet spots for not only producing renewable energy, um, like electricity, but also then, then green hydrogen. And I would certainly name the North Sea, but also the Baltic Sea, and then really Greece, the again, again um, um, sea are these sweet spots to mention. And it has been also said already that it's not the only um, asset that we're looking at, but we are also looking at the gas grid as a major asset we are having in Europe and also as a major point to keeping our integration. And if I look to the Mediterranean here, we can see kind of very important interconnectors. But I would also say that we see still major challenges actually with regard to further um, expanding and also looking into cohesion, not only of the gas um, market and of the gas infrastructure, but especially and in particular when we use the gas grid with regard to hydrogen, because as you all know, and this has been said before by Professor Karpus as well, it can be repurposed and this is a very important thing to think about. Um, and here we can see that there is, is uh, still something to be done with regard, especially to the geopolitically important region between, well, the three seas, but the Adria, Adriatic Sea, but also the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. And this is why I also talked about the challenge of European integration. I think what we're seeing right now are kind of very different speeds with regard to developing um, decarbonized gas system decarbonization. So this indeed is a political challenge for the EU with regard to cohesion. And it has been said by, I think, really all previous speakers, and I would like to also really emphasize that um, I think it should be a European project if we're talking about hydrogen. And there are political reasons, but there are also industrial energy policy reasons for that. First of all, we have embarked on a green deal. Climate mitigation is our major goal. We want to look into a carbon neutral uh, Europe. And this also includes looking into the neighboring regions, like especially also the MENA region, where, of course, the Mediterranean is kind of the in-between and the bridge into the region. 
And it's also very important to kind of look to these producers in North Africa, but also the Levante, Maghreb, Mashrek states, not only as potential producers for green hydrogen, but also if we look into Algeria, if we look, look to Egypt, if we look further to the Gulf, here is a big challenge in geopolitical terms. Here are regions, countries that we want actually to co-opt for our climate mitigation path. And it's important to throw these countries a lifeline and they can develop a new um, pathway into hydrogen. My second point that I wanted to make with regard to why a European project, what role for the Mediterranean, and this has been also said, I mean, we, we are looking into green recovery after the COVID pandemia. We have the issue of the next generation EU, and this really makes up the, the combination between energy and industrial policy so important. So we're talking about how to create growth and jobs and um, this will be also a big challenge in, in developing, as it has been pointed out, a clean, competitive and circular system. And especially this, the third point of a circular system, I think is extremely important to look with regard in, um, to the hydrogen value chain as well. And then um, again, back um, to the point of, of cohesion and integration, I, I would also see the European hydrogen pathway really in line and in the tradition of the European coal and steel and euro atom um, community, but especially coal and steel, because we are again looking to the steel sector as not only being a very strategic one, but a major one that has to be decarbonized with the use of hydrogen. And this brings me to the technological, but also industrial challenge that we're talking about. And this has been mentioned um, quite often. And I think we can't mention it too often because we have really somehow in a, in a hydrogen race. You know, it's, it's a hype. We're talking about hydrogen, but we are really seeing concrete projects being developed, concrete projects also being developed um, in order to put the structures on the ground, put them working by others with, with no regard actually in, in the first um, step to the carbon content. So we are, we have to position ourselves as Europe in, in the hydrogen race. And we're seeing Asia, China, Japan, but also the US moving ahead. And my point that I would like to make here, and I, I'm showing right, you right now, the map of the um, European hydrogen backbone as it has been developed. I think we can only join in the race and only um, be part of the race and the forerunner if we bring our act together. And this does not only mean, better to say, it first means, of course, um, developing hydrogen value chains in Europe and integrated ones, but it also means looking into the neighboring regions. I think for Europe, it will be crucial how it can really work within the European context. And of course, we're seeing uh, coming out of, well, Berlin, Northwestern Europe as, as a major zone and um, hydrogen valley. And this has been pointed out by a recent Klingendale and International Energy Agency strategy um, paper. But I would also see, and please remember the map that I showed, um, the Mediterranean, Adriatic, Aegeus, um, Eastern Mediterranean region as really a sweet spot. And from these um, centers, valleys, clusters, we then have really to work on integrating a, a European market. And, and indeed, if we look to the map, it's, it's, a, it's a European Union market, but it has to integrate our neighboring regions. And that brings me to my final slide, actually, why I really think Greece has actually a, 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 a crucial role to play, not only as a producer of hydrogen, if I look to the potential, if I look to the IPSA projects like White Dragon, which really looks into the, the whole value chain, but also because of the 
huge offshore wind potential that we're seeing. So I think um, the point would be here really to make that Europe has to get its act together. And we have to think in really scaling up the hydrogen valleys. And um, with regard to the time, thank you very much. I will stop here. Thank you a lot, Mrs. Westphal, for these interesting inputs also on the European geopolitical perspective at this point. Um, we are a little bit behind uh, the schedule, but I would still like to take um, the opportunity to discuss or, or pose some questions, at least uh, for the next five minutes, if possible. And for that, I've seen already from the audience. Let's start with the audience question here, which is directed to um, Professor Capris here, um, on what concept is hydrogen intended to be employed for the interconnected islands as storage media for grid balancing or as end product for use such in the transportation, land and maritime sectors? That is the question coming from the audience. Uh, it, it, dep it depends on the time horizon, of course. Um, I mean, if we, if we need an interconnected island in the long term to become also climate neutral, then hydrogen has to be also a transport fuel. And, and um, so in this case, uh, it is also a fuel. Uh, there is a role of hydrogen in the shorter term as a, a way of uh, storing electricity. And um, this uh, would be, you know, seasonal storage of electricity because the batteries uh, have a, a short cycle of storage, contrary to hydrogen. Uh, of course, uh, the cost matter a lot and uh, is the main obstacle. However, uh, as I said, uh, the learning and industrialization process will bring much cheaper hydrogen in the future. And so, this will be an, an option also for the interconnected islands. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor Karpus. I would like to add a question here for you. Um, we have heard a lot already about the potentials now for Greece and, and uh, Greece in the whole European um, strategy when it comes to, to hydrogen. Now there would be the question, how, in your opinion, um, could be the next steps for the regulation side also in Greece to support this hydrogen market ramp up? How could we really step by step uh, reach that, that potential of Greece? Yeah, thank you for this question. Um, the first uh, step is to complete uh, the regulatory and legislative uh, framework. Uh, it is quite feasible to do that. Uh, it is, um, in my opinion, an extension of the current legislative framework. There is also issues about uh, technical legislation standards and the safety uh, regulations uh, to be to be covered. Uh, so step by step, um, I think that we will propose uh, very concrete uh, ways of uh, completing the legislation. The second, uh, first uh, uh, important step are the demonstration uh, projects. I will talk about large scale demonstration projects in uh, selected areas because this will uh, not only demonstrate, but we expect that they will be doing the, the a role of kick starting the private investment in, in various sectors. So it is very important that the demonstrations. Uh, uh, work. We have, for example, uh, discussions about uh, the um, Western Macedonia area, uh, which is um, under a huge transition away from Lignite. Uh, we give priority to the to the ports, the maritime sector as an application. We also have a, a priority to an application to an island. So it has been mentioned already. And uh, to a transport uh, hub, the transport case, or an industrial uh, application, this, this is uh, still open. So we need to shape the details of these uh, possibilities and uh, propose to the government ways of uh, 
demonstrating in practice the usefulness of hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor Kapros, for answering this question. Um, Mrs. Uh, Dr. Kirsten Westphal, since you are a member also of the Hydrogen Council in Germany, these steps that have been also presented by Mr. Kapros probably were also part of the discussions in the Council. And I would like to maybe raise a bit here uh, on raise the experiences you've made in the council, since we have also members of the Greek council here among the participants. What challenges and milestones have you reached so far in the council? What are the key uh, questions that you are daily uh, uh, dealing with? Yeah. Well, um, this is a, a huge question. Um, actually, I mean, the, the council is there to advise um, the government on how to implement the national hydrogen strategy. So it's our starting point. Um, and we are looking into the 38 measures that are um, pointed out there and trying to advise there how to implement these. And indeed, as Professor Kapos has mentioned, the major regulatory points. So um, we are also seeing that past dependencies play a major role with regard, especially to the institutional and the regulatory framework. But it's indeed um, very much also the question if, if we start, if we're kicking off the hydrogen production, how to address the, the well-known hen and egg problem. So, so how to address, how to make the infrastructure hydrogen ready. This is why I very much pointed to, to the important factor of interconnectivity, both inside countries in the European Union, but also beyond. And then also really, um, yeah, starting demand and, and how to really bring this hen and egg problem together is a major issue. And then, of course, if, if you look into that when you're discussing the issue of um, do we really have a kind of merit order? Where should we have the, 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 the first amount of, 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 of carbon neutral hydrogen or carbon friendly hydrogen for, for which sectors? And these have been mentioned as well. I mean, it's the industry, of course, it's heavy, trans heavy duty transport. And, and then discussions start what, what should come next. But in general, I think what we all should look deeply into, and this has been mentioned by Professor Carpus, by, by Mr. Diewald as well, is that the big role that hydrogen can play both as a carrier, but also as a medium to store and therefore to balance our energy system, because we are really looking into huge challenges with regard to energy security and resilience. And this is to me the fascinating um, role that hydrogen has to play. Thank you, Mrs. Westphal. Uh, you've also mentioned now the key word of Han and Egg problem, and uh, one of those are the let's say the production side and then we have also the the offtaker side and for that mr Diewald, maybe i could ask here how can we also push the offtaker side and make uh, make sure that we do not only push the production side only but at, in parallel also the offtaker side what steps are necessary for that and where do we stand here it depends on short term or on the long term i think in the long term we need to regulation uh, we see it, for me, it's uh, really the few sector, the best uh, yeah, example. We have this um, requirement to integrate the renewable energies. Or so in Germany, I like this uh, model more, develop it out from the, the energy target to a greenhouse gas reduction target. I think that is more visible and more clear and more in line with our targets of 2030 and 2050. And we have to reduce it 6% to 2020 and uh, now around 25, 2% uh, to 2030. And that gives suddenly uh, green fuels, uh, economic fair market, the market design. So we see it, all the, the refineries fulfill the targets. I think it's good for the whole Europe. And they fulfill the targets to buying uh, biofuels. Of course, we have make some mistakes as a biofuels and um, but we have learned for that now we have a phase out for the first generation but there's a market for green hydrogen 
especially for the plus green hydrogen using in the refineries, but also in the transition time for the e-fuels. I think we have to look on the existing fleet. If we only look on the new cars, I think we never can reach the targets in the transport sector in 2000, of 2030. Um, we have to integrate the existing fleet. And especially, I think, that is a little bit, I think, a luxury view which some people have, especially in Germany on it. Okay, buy a battery car, no problem. Of course, if you have money, no problem. Or a few cell car, no problem. But for a family with two children, and perhaps now, especially in the corona time, without any job. So you can't go to him and say, do you have to buy a new car? If not, you can't drive with your car in the city. Oh, sorry, you have two kids? No, it's your problem. I think that is not really working in a social way. And if you look to some other countries like Bulgaria, Romania, or Spain, or so on, they drive the car around 17 years. So the existing fleet, the cars which we sell today, and we sell today combustion cars, drive in the middle of 2000, uh, of the middle of the, the 30 years. So we need, as I know that it's not really efficiency to use e-fuels in the mobility sector. It's a little bit from physical side, if you have a physical view on it, it's, it's a little bit crazy, I'm honest. But that is in the system, it works only with this uh, solution. So I think that is really, you ask me what are the, the, the solutions? I think that is really a solution to give some clear targets. So that is investment security, because it's first everybody will say, oh, crazy, oh, we have to fill it. But it's investment security. And you can do it also for steel perks, example. We have to reduce the footprint of steel production and not for the, oh, sorry, not for the production, for the steel which you bring in the European market. So it's independent if you produce it in the European or outside European. If you bring the steel in the market, you have to reduce your footprint if you compare it with 2020 or whatever. So I think there are some possibilities really to, to create a regulatory framework which give really a market design for green hydrogen or for other green products. Uh, but in the short term, I think we're already in this challenge, I mentioned it out. I think this H global concept, this auction concept is really a solution. It's, it's a CCFD program. But you, you say it very easy. Yeah, we need or we make CCFD system. It's great. But make it in line with the European uh, regulations, with uh, this um, trading regulations, uh, market fairness regulations, and so on. And so this auction system really works in it. And it, it's, there's, this system provides no benefits against the other market uh, participants. So I think that is so you have a fair market. And on the other side, you have really a solution to bring very, very soon the green products, the green hydrogen, and the dairy rates in the market. I think that is a challenge. Find the solutions for, for short market, for investment security, and start um the the transition i think that is another benefit of hydrogen hydrogen has a possibility to create a transition to feed in green hydrogen and natural gas pipelines if you go to the physics uh, guys say oh the green hydrogen this is good hydrogen you feed it in the gas pipe crazy crazy uh but in the transition time i think it's it's really acceptance uh, solutions uh, if you reach numbers of volumes which can fill a, a pipe okay we switch it in a pure hydrogen but if we start with 200 megawatt 300 400 megawatt and that is a huge number for this business in the moment there is for the pipe nothing for a big transition pipe it's nothing and i think on the other side it's a solution would be to start to transit this green energy perhaps from greece to a refinery in germany then they have a steam reformer there and they can fulfill their own targets so I think that is a win-win situation and we need this. It's a subsidy program, but I think it's a really market, uh, very, very close to the market, the system, and uh, we need both. So not only to look on subsidies, at the same time, we have to look on the regulation and we have to start now the discussion for these regulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Divat, for summing up here. I think um, 
We are now starting with a short break. Thank you a lot uh, to our participant of that first session. And uh, we indeed have to digest all these information now. And therefore, I suggest uh, a short break um, for five minutes. So we will come back and meet again at 11.20. So welcome back for the second part of our workshop. I hope you had a little break and uh, could breathe uh, once more before we uh, continue. So in the first part, we have shattered light on the production side. Uh, we would equally look into the possibilities for the use of green hydrogen for decarbonization and therefore looking also into the different application fields. We have touched upon this in the very last um, speaking slot. And for that, I would like to introduce Dr. Carsten Rolle. He's head of the Department of Energy and Climate Policy at the Federation of German Industries since 2013. And he has been Secretary General of the German Member Committee of the World Energy Council since 2005. And Dr. Rolle, you contributed to the very spark of the discussions on hydrogen with a study commission to analyze the potential of hydrogen in various countries with the World Energy Council. And so Dr. Rolle, thanks for giving us more insights on the perspective of the industry and on the application fields of hydrogen in the industry. So warm welcome to you. Thank you very much, Ms. Vabzada, for the kind introduction and uh, a warm welcome from my side. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I couldn't follow all the discussions you had this morning, but from what I see, and as you said, um, you've uh, dabbed already quite deep into uh, several questions of national hydrogen strategies. What I want to do is, in fact, uh, briefly to give you an overview of what's going on internationally, globally. Is that what we discuss in Germany, in Greece, in Europe? Really part of a broader picture and then um, give you an insight, at least on how hydrogen is actually perceived and discussed within the manufacturing industries as part of the solution. And uh, with having um, and discussing even more ambitious uh, climate policy targets in these days in Germany, we're just about to reform law uh, in this week, this gets even more important, I think, uh, as hydrogen has to be part of the solution as the missing link. We have many options in industry to reduce um, carbon emissions by energy efficiency, by further electrification, to name just the, the, probably the two biggest. Um, but of course, biomass, CCUS technology and hydrogen are other important uh, solutions. And the whole picture of that will have to be used to meet the very ambitious targets. And that's uh, what I try to visualize with this uh, with this picture of the iceberg. Um, you know, know that uh, only 20% of at least today's energy is electricity in Germany, but also more or less globally. So basically, we're still talking about a lot of molecules, fossil energies, basically, that have to be decarbonized. Uh, and even if the picture will change in the future, maybe we'll, we'll discuss in a couple of years, uh, more or less two equal parts of electricity and molecules in the end, and hopefully a smaller iceberg by, by efficiency reasons, there is still a lot that has to be done and hydrogen can play a major role here. This is especially true for manufacturing industries, um, as we are quite far developed in Germany, at least many other countries as well, in decarbonizing the electricity sector with renewable energies. I remember well the discussions we had with Greece uh, 10 years ago with the Helios project. I've been involved in this a little bit uh, with BDI. Um, that was the idea of also making use of the huge potentials, uh, at least in, in, in Southern Europe, by exporting uh, renewables directly uh, as electricity. And now I think uh, there's a new chapter with the same idea uh, the renewable potentials globally are uneven, um, but uh, this is an uh, invitation for further cooperation, uh, as I would see it. And German industry will need a lot of uh, green molecules um, to stay in Europe and to really decarbonize its processes as we've uh, committed to do so. Now, what's the global picture in a minute? 
Um, with World Energy Council last year, we, we looked uh, into the developments of national hydrogen strategies globally. And uh, we saw for long um, quite a, a very well established discussion in Southern Asia, in Japan, uh, first of all, and then in South Korea with two quite outstanding hydrogen strategies being formulated by governments. But for long, these were more or less the only examples. Um, and Europe really has started a new development just a year ago uh, with a lot of countries um, publishing their own hydrogen strategy, but not only in Europe, also other countries, as you see here in the picture. So there is a new dynamic in politics, not only in Europe, but also in Europe in um, getting more commitment, political commitment for hydrogen. So we are not an island in this respect, but we are part of a more international development. That's the key message. And if you see on the global map here, the dark blue countries are those countries that have already published a hydrogen strategy by their governments. And with the lighter colors, you see countries that are just preparing uh, such strategies or at least have uh, larger demonstration projects. It is a development, as I said, that is an international one. Um, and we, Europe has a chance uh, to also play a major role in formulating the rules uh, and in making use of uh, its technology competences. This looks a bit more complicated as it is. Uh, that's the discussion of the colors of hydrogen. You will probably have already discussed the different ways of producing hydrogen. In these strategies that I mentioned, you see, at least for the midterm <clears throat> until 2030, um, they all, more, all of us, um, make use of the existing technology of gray hydrogen, as well as introducing new ways based on renewables, that's the so-called green hydrogen, or of CCUS technologies um, together with uh, producing hydrogen, that's the blue hydrogen. So it's a broad mixture of colors. But in the longer term, up to 2050, more or less all strategies would focus on green hydrogen and say half of them would also think of adding fossil based uh, hydrogen production with CCS technologies as part of the solution. So we go greener but we start with a broader um, mix of production technologies. That's what we at least see in the political announcements. Now, looking on the demand side, and you've asked for the role of hydrogen in industry and in the other sectors, um, you see here, at least uh, with regard to the countries we, we look deeper into, all of these countries uh, more or less uh, focus on transport sector. For, for long, this has been discussion also of the first hydrogen discussion hype 10 or 15 years ago. And it's still part of the discussion. As we know, there's some hard to obey technologies in aviation and shipment, in, in trucking, heavy trucking. But you see as well that the other sector uh, that is mostly addressed is manufacturing industries by many, many um, strategies mentioned here. There is also a role for hydrogen, at least in the mid and longer term, in building sector and power sector for balancing in order to balance the uh, fluctuating renewable electricity systems. Um, but at least transport and industry are the two probably outstanding ones being mentioned most often. Now, what are the um, sectors where hydrogen will play clearly a bigger role? What are sectors where it is in competition with other technologies such as uh, further electrification? This is uh, shown here a little bit. You see in especially manufacturing industries where carbon is also a, as a feedstock part of the product with, um, for example, in the steel sector, in some of the refineries um, as, as a raw material, and there's clearly no alternative uh, by, by electrification, and there are other reasons why hydrogen and hydrogen-based derivatives as methanol, as ammonia, will play a significant role in decarbonizing the manufacturing industry sector. That's the first blue bar. There is hardly anything else we can think of at the moment. Same is true for, uh, for shipping and for larger parts of aviation. Um, maybe as methanol, maybe as hydrogen. This is not perfectly clear at the moment. I think the products based on hydrogen 
are also part of a competition of technologies, but clearly we will not be able to, to run long distance flights uh, on, on, on batteries. In the heavy duty transport sector, there is already competition of the technologies. Um, and even more so um, in light vehicles, we clearly see electrification as the bigger part. Maybe there are smaller segments where hydrogen based uh, products can play a role, but it will be from what we can see um, uh, clearly more of electrification. So within the industry, it's to place, replace oil and gas uh, as a base chemical, as feedstock, as I said. And um, these are long uh, investment cycles we are talking about. In the chemical industry, we talk about introducing and making use of larger parts of hydrogen, mainly in the 2030s. Um, there is, of course, already a big uh, uh, demand in refineries, uh, existing refineries that could also be replaced gray hydrogen by green hydrogen, for instance. But in larger parts, additional uh, demand will arise probably in the 2030s um, from what we can see today um, uh, by replacing the existing feedstock. In the steel industry, um, the reduction path might be a bit faster as um, there is already um, a planning of new technologies, the RI technologies of making use hydrogen in the production of, of steel to replace the existing coal. Um, this might be also a two-step approach, first replacing the coal by gas, and then a second step, replace the gas by hydrogen. Of course, that's also um, depending on the development of the costs, uh, but at least the production technologies uh, will go in this direction rather than in the direction of CCS technologies, which also be, could be possible, but maybe for acceptance, acceptance reasons is not the way the industry is going for. So we see, um, especially end of the 20s, already the steel industry in Germany, uh, with the support mechanisms that, that have been mentioned, with the additional support that is needed um, to make use of it, as a big um, demand player for hydrogen in Germany and abroad, as we will clearly not be able to produce the hydrogen in Germany that is needed um, for the big amounts that, that we're talking about. We're talking about replacing refineries, as I said, and in other parts of industry, and I'll jump now just to, to give a broad range. There's so many uh, strategies, as so many studies, on what is the precise figure, obviously we don't know. That's the, the honest answer. But we see we are uh, easily talking about big figures. Um, if you look into the strategies and the studies uh, that I mentioned here, um, they differ largely, but we clearly come to significant figures uh, in the 2030s and beyond. Uh, when it comes to hydrogen use in manufacturing industries, as well as, of course, for the economy in total as well. Um, just to give an example, um, in the chemical industry, for instance, the energy demand of the chemical industry in Germany is just the same as the complete uh, electricity demand of Germany. So the question to what extent the chemical industry would electrify or would make use hydrogen is just making a difference uh, in the whole picture. And that is starting now. What of the processes will be electrified? Uh, high temperature processes, um, is that possible? Or do we stay with, um, with hydrogen um, as, a, uh, as a feedstock, not only, but also as a means uh, for these high temperatures to, to get them and to produce it? Or are there other technologies coming in later? This is, uh, is clearly to some, uh, some part already um, not perfectly defined, but will be, I think, and has to be defined in the next years in order to make the infrastructure um, ready and at the same time and uh, to make sure that the industry really has um, a clear horizon for its planning. I jump on with the national strategy. I think that has been already mentioned and the different elements that have to be a prerequisite to make hydrogen really a reality, not only a vision. Uh, you have already started to talk about regulatory framework conditions and I've heard Mr. Diewald talking about 
um, auctioning systems and also uh, OPEX subsidies for the make use of hydrogen. This is, of course, uh, a significant uh, element uh, to make use next to a carbon price uh, within Europe. Uh, I think the mixture of these elements, carbon pricing, subsidies, quotas, other elements, um, have to add up to really bridge the difference in costs between the existing fossils and the new foss uh, and the new alternatives, the carbon-free alternatives. And how this project will look like will be part, I think, of the next uh, government's uh, plan. Uh, Germany has an election in, in uh, autumn, in September. And I think next government clearly has to define these rules very early Otherwise, we will uh, not be able to meet the very ambitious targets that we're just about to formulate in these days. Um, you have already, I think, identified electricity cost as a major player. And that's why I think um, we're talking so much about international cooperation uh, with Southern Europe, with other parts in the world as Germany is probably not best positioned in producing renewables as cheaply as other parts of the world could produce so. And by that, importing the energy via hydrogen, via ammonia or methanol from other parts of the world by a pipeline ship. Um, but I think the potential for cooperation is really laying in this element, electricity cost, drive hydrogen cost next to the electrolyzer cost on the technology side. I saw a map by Kirsten Westphal on the grid side, so I can jump, I think, also on this. We have clusters, industrial clusters in Germany. These are highlighted by the green spots here. And if we talk about uh, a backbone, a European hydrogen backbone, we will probably start by connecting these demand centers and the supply centers, and from then onwards um, to really uh, build up a broader grid, but that's the starting point. I've talked about the cost and come clearly and fast to the, to the end um, by just summarizing up. I see huge potential for further cooperation. Um, we would be very happy, uh, of course, to see Greece also jumping on this road uh, and digging into the uh, group of countries that want to drive the hydrogen ramp up uh, technology wise. And I think Germany has to offer quite some expertise here. And not only, but also in electrolyzer technologies, but also in, in other parts of making use of hydrogen in the different demand sectors. We're quite advanced here, but also on the import expert relationship um, to make use of the potentials that are really laying on the table. Thank you very much, Ms. Vahabzada. Hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Rolle, for this better understanding of where hydrogen is already used and where it becomes also relevant in the industrial sector. And uh, you've already mentioned the transport uh, sector as key. Uh, I'm sure we will come to, to the discussion on later, um, Dr. Carsten Rollo, for now. Thank you so much. And we will switch to Franz Lehner, who is um, head of division international cooperation at the National Organization for Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Technology, which is fully owned by the federal government and takes on assignments from federal ministries in the area of sustainable mobility and energy supply. And before Franz Lena, you've also already were working at a consulting firm where you had um, also the responsibility for numerous projects on power to X and hydrogen. So it's great having you here, please. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Babsada, for the kind introduction. Um, dear co-speakers, dear participants, it's a pleasure to be here today and present some of the perspective we have um, from the German side on the transport sector for hydrogen. Um, let me briefly introduce NOW. We are um, a fully governmental owned agency that works to implement German national support programs um, across a, a variety of topics, um, but with a strong focus on zero emission mobility solutions. Um, so we um, historically have uh, worked a lot uh, more in fuel cells and hydrogen than um, uh, right now in, in the balance. We actually have more colleagues uh, these days working in better electric mobility and charging infrastructure. Um, so we have a really holistic perspective to this challenge, but we still have um, also all the competence around hydrogen and fuel cells in our team. 
And um, these three highlighted programs here in red are those that concern fuel cell hydrogen technology. A few examples of projects that are being supported through the Ministry for Transport are listed here. And um, as you can see, um, based on the icons, it's, it's really a broad area of applications um, that, um, that can use hydrogen in transport here. And we also support development of um, components of, of new technologies, um, R&D, all as part of the National Innovation Program for Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Technology. Um, and then to um, an aspect that has been mentioned earlier also, um, there's always this big question how to really start a market uptake. And one concept that has been um, more frequently adopted globally, um, probably with the lead of the European Union and the fuel cell and hydrogen joint undertaking in Europe is, is the kind of hydrogen valley approach to find and identify specific clusters um, from where to grow uh, local hydrogen ecosystems. So not just uh, thinking about one electrolyzer or, or one fleet of fuel cell buses or trucks, but really um, use an integrated approach. Um, also similar to what uh, Deputy Director Bentebush mentioned earlier in his speech. So um, using those local platforms to then grow further. And the three of those you can see here, which are currently being supported by the Ministry for Transport and which include uh, a number of different transport applications from trucks um, to um, um, intra logistics to um, garbage trucks more recently um, to buses, electrolyzers. So opening the field for, for wider application here. And um, the, the next bigger level for those activities would then be the, the projects that have been mentioned already by previous speakers, the so-called IPSIS, um, important projects of, of common European interest, which would be somehow one um, order of magnitude bigger and which are currently being in the, in the selection phase. Um, and also at NOW, we, as I mentioned, have historically been very much embedded in the global hydrogen initiative landscape. So we, we've always been around um, even before hydrogen became a mainstream topic in the, in the broader discussion. Um, so all these topics that have uh, inherently an international character like sustainability criteria, like trade rules, like um, how to bring hydrogen from A to B around the globe are, are topics that we can't address at the national level. And NOW is, is very well embedded in those multilateral initiatives. And so that's also one of the roles we see to um, provide this insight and network to our partners in Germany, in the different ministries, with the different implementation agencies of, of, of the different ministries, but also um, in fostering the international exchange with uh, our partners abroad, obviously also including Greece, of course. Um, but to come now to the role for hydrogen in transport, I actually will um, take a step back and start um, once more at the global energy picture very briefly. It, it has been um, mentioned in, in some previous presentations already. Um, Professor Kapros um, outlined the, the global challenge to reach uh, 1.5 degree scenario uh, and which measures are needed for that. Um, here, I just uh, like to show again the energy mix as of today, we have mainly fossil energy. So also reiterating um, Dr. Carsten Rolle's point about the 2080 molecules and hydro uh, molecules and electrons. So today, 80% are molecules of our energy carrier. And so you see already if we want to electrify as much as we can on the demand side, a lot of those molecule uses have to turn into electron uses and there's um, a challenge to it. So even though it is possible to electrify a lot, it's also a question of how quickly we can fully switch the demand side. So for example, how quickly can we actually refurbish all the buildings um, to allow for heat pumps as, um, as efficient heating systems using electricity? How quickly can we transfer the entire transportation sector? And also here, including clearly the road transport sector, as um, Bernard Ewald also mentioned, that um, the cars that are being purchased today will be on the road for, for quite a long time. Um, so it's, it's, it's not a one day to another um, decision to change that. But we want all to end up in a net zero future, ideally by 2050 in Germany, hopefully a bit earlier, uh, globally 
realistically maybe a few years later, but that is kind of commonly agreed as the as where we want to get to. And once that is accepted, there are several challenges to this. The, the world economy, economy is still growing. So yes, efficiency is important, but um, past experience have shown too much optimism about what efficiency can really contribute, um, should be looked at with a grain of salt. So for simplicity, let's assume the efficiency gains will be eaten up by demand growth. End use electrification has its limits. So global energy system studies that look at a net zero system by 2050 or 2060 um, conclude broadly that around 50 to 60% of all energy uses and energy uses can be electrified. So we are then left with a chunk of molecule demand um, in the order of 150 to 200 exatrules. And the question is where can those molecules come from? So biomass has its sustainability limitations, fossil fuels and CCS could be an option purely from, from a climate perspective. I would um, have a slightly different view here about how interesting they are economically, because they must also be interesting for the investors. Um, so uh, only if they are really zero carbon, they are interesting. If they have uh, remaining emissions, uh, sooner or later, they have to be compensated as well. So from an investor perspective today, I would argue that uh, hydrogen from wind and hydrogen offer the better um, more attractive investment case. Um, and while existing gray hydrogen production may be usefully converted to blue hydrogen, I wonder if it's really realistic to say that um, greenfield projects with um, blue hydrogen offer a good investment case, because um, why would they be so much faster than, than green hydrogen projects, which are also a technology that is readily available. So. Um, as much as, as other options like biomass efficiency or fossil fuels with CCS will struggle, um, as much um, hydrogen from wind and solar have to compensate for it. So this is essentially our insurance policy in, in reaching a 1.5 degree scenario, which has to catch all, all other things that may not go according to the perfect plan. Um, and the good news is, um, once we accept that this role for green hydrogen and green molecules is there, um, we, we see that um, it actually can be delivered. So the, the great news of, um, of the last 20 years is that renewable electricity became so cheap that this is a realistic way forward and that we are not longer fundamentally constrained by energy limitation or limitation of clean energy. It's more now a question of speed. And um, that brings us to my next slide. So with those, energy system models in a net zero world, we actually need a huge amount of, of electro electrolyzers to turn green electrons into green molecules. Um, as uh, Vanity Diewald mentioned, it's comparable to the oil and gas business. So it doesn't help to think in small bits and pieces here. We really need to think big to, to tackle this challenge. Um, between three and 13 terawatts of electrolyzer capacity globally in a net zero world. Where we are today, we are at less than 100 megawatts deployed a year currently. So this sounds like a huge bridge that we have to gap to get from tens of gigawatts in 2030 globally to hundreds of gigawatts in 2040. Nevertheless, um, the photovoltaics industry has shown exactly that transition over the last 20 years. So we already have an example that has proven that these kind of scale up speeds are possible. Um, and um, also there is enough potential for renewable electricity. So um, without going too much detail to supply all the global electricity that is needed from solar and wind, um, it, is, it is a huge amount like uh, in the next 30 years, um, every day we would need to install around 30 square kilometers of PV, for example, that sounds a lot, but it's only around 20 times the current size of the photovoltaics in manufacturing industry. So it's still, a challenging journey, but it's not impossible. Um, but what does that mean for the electrolyzer industry? We have, um, in my previous job, uh, done a study also for my current company, NOW, uh, on electrolysis industrialization. And that shows um, how difficult it is to get the early ramp up of production. And that translates now to the question of why hydrogen in transport is important. The current electrolyzer industry is small. We know where we have to get to. And the initial ramp up is, is the hardest to do as with, with any technology development and any um, market scale up. So um, 
would uh, reinforce the point of, of Deputy Director um, uh, Mr. Benterbush that pragmatism in the early years is very important to not have too strict um, uh, regime for using electricity in, in producing hydrogen. So to keep the regulatory burden low in the beginning when it actually doesn't really matter in the overall scheme. And then um, step by step increase the, the um, change the regulations more strictly for sustainable criteria for additionality of renewables, etc. And also um, let uh, the industry do the scale up with in industry dynamics. So um, don't let the government build the, manuf the manufacturing lines, but um, just uh, provide a clear framework and then let the industry do the scale up. Where mobility comes in is um, as a use that has been mentioned before, where high price is uh, being paid today. So with uh, mobility applications, especially in the road sector, you don't compete just with the heating value of gasoline or diesel, um, but you have a much higher readiness to pay. And this is something we should leverage for the early build up of green hydrogen production. And we have done an estimation within NOW, and that's essentially the core of what we see as the potential for, for hydrogen in mobility towards 2030 here on this slide. Um, the refineries that have been mentioned, which can turn gray hydrogen into green hydrogen, can create an initial demand in the order of maybe one gigawatt. E-fuels for aviation, which will be, um, uh, for which will be required in, in the new rules, um, maybe represent an amount of two gigawatts roughly for, for Germany. But then we have actually road transport, trucks mainly, um, where we hear from the OEMs plans until 2030 that would roughly equal an additional electrolyzer demand of around four gigawatts. So you see we already exceed with this pure transport hydrogen demand, um, the five gigawatts that are planned for domestic installations by 2030 in Germany, um, which again point at uh, we need to import hydrogen already in 2030. And the mobility sector can help us here. And now maybe some of you have noticed there's a quite heated discussion in Germany currently whether hydrogen in passenger cars is a good thing or a bad thing. I think it's neither good or bad. It's just something that there's no reason for ruling it out um, because first of all, by 2030, there will be not that many passenger cars because the OEMs are not uh, supplying enough uh, compared to the, the demand. Um, we expect that maybe um, there will be 50 times more hydrogen demand for fuel cell trucks in 2030 than for passenger cars. So why rule that out um, why, when it can be an opportunity in the long run to 2050? Um, and uh, in 2050, we would have enough hydrogen. If, if we say in 2050, hydrogen will be limited or green molecules will be limited, then basically we, we kind of give up on, on the net zero plan because hydrogen will have to be a widely um, um, available commodity by then. Um, so, the pressure that is created for the transport sector, for the fuel, fuel retailers, but also for the automotive companies is, is, is the main reason why we can achieve higher prices in the transport sector, not just from the customer, but also from the industry and uh, fuel retailers. We have um, to meet very um, strong reductions in CO2 emissions in the transport sector over the next nine years. And, these targets are currently, as has been mentioned, under revision and will be even tighter. So um, there is the, the pressure is much more imminent here than in other sectors that have longer transition times like steel or fertilizer industries, et cetera. Um, in transport, we can really um, build on projectable, predictable hydrogen demands in the next years and use them as early um, catalysts for, for market take up. And my last slide is um, opening another angle for this discussion um, that uh, State Secretary Thomas Rachel also mentioned, um, creating jobs and uh, economic um, stimulus through industrial development in new technologies. Um, there's currently not so much interest from car makers or um, OEMs in Europe to, to come up with fuel cell products, but there's a lot of activity, as has been mentioned by various speakers today, in other regions in the world, in Korea, in China, um, in Japan. And many of our European supply chain companies in the automotive industry are investing in fuel cell technology, are positioning themselves. 
in this technology. But without a home market in Europe, they have to go to Asia and build their manufacturing lines there, which is exactly what's currently happening. Um, and uh, on the right hand side, you see the, the manufacturing of fuel cell systems globally. And you see that there's very, very little happening in Europe, despite the strong technology position of those companies. Um, but they are being pushed to invest in other world regions because sometimes we, we think we, we, we want to do the perfect energy transition and we want to exclude certain options in our discussion. Um, it, I think it's, it's, it's a dangerous way to do it because it pushes um, value add and jobs um, out of Europe. So um, let's keep the, the level playing field for all the options while at the same time acknowledging that of, it, of course battery electric vehicles in the passenger segment will play um, a very important role. So this is all from my side for the moment. I'm, I'm looking forward to discussion and um, to um, questions later. Thank you very much, Mr. Lena, for giving us a better view on the usage of hydrogen in the transport sector and how this could also be partially implemented on site. I think Mr. Moraitis will present now in the following. Um, Mr. Moraitis is project manager, hydrogen and biomethane at the Public Gas Corporation, DEPA. And we are indeed excited to learn more within the next uh, minutes about how hydrogen and its derivatives play a role in the White Dragon project, one of the front running projects in that field in the region that has been also mentioned today earlier. Thank you for, for, uh, for your presentation, Mr. Moraitis. Thank you very much. Um, greetings to all um, the guests, the experts and the organizers. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, for me as a Greek born and raised in Germany, this event is even more unique, I can say. Uh, and I'm very, very happy to participate. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, it is really fascinating to see that hydrogen receives the attention it actually deserves. And it is great to see that hydrogen um, has become the epicenter of intense discussions um, in Europe, but also on the national levels. I think that the other speakers already outlined some of the key discussions that are currently um, ongoing. Um, I do believe that the transition to a climate neutral economy creates uh, one of the most significant policy objectives for the European Union. Um, the target of accomplishing a climate neutral un union by 2050 in line with the objectives of the Paris Agreement uh, culminated in the previous summer uh, to the hydrogen strategy and the setup of the European Clean Hydrogen Alliance, which we at DEPA are very proud to be part of, holding also uh, one of the co-chair positions. Um, I'm referring to the Clean Hydrogen Alliance mainly because uh, the alliance is divided into six roundtables, which basically correspond to the uh, different hydrogen sectors. Um, and this is basically showing the vast and broad spectrum hydrogen can be applied in, uh, and in order to decarbonize the, the EU economy. Um, the previous speakers already mentioned some of the uh, different sectors, uh, NOW, NOV, um, transport and mobility, um, we, we touched upon uh, transmission and distribution via pipelines, uh, but also via lorries. Um, we talked about the industrial applications, steel, chemical uh, industry, refineries, the e-fuels, and so on and so forth. Um, of course, the uh, energy sector for the re-electrification, the mega storage of, uh, of renewable uh, electricity, grid balancing, only some keywords. Um, and then, of course, the use of hydrogen in, in residential applications, mainly in, in uh, district heating, combined heat and power systems, um, and so on and so forth. So what we can see is that basically um, hydrogen is, 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 is very broad in its spectrum that it can be applied to. And this is, I think, also the main advantage of hydrogen um, when we are talking about decarbonizing uh, the EU economy. Um, However, even if fighting climate change will benefit all member states in the long run, uh, it offers different chances and challenges in the medium term. Uh, not all regions in Europe start the transition from the same point or have the same capacity to respond to the new challenges. 
um, regions that once were considered the foundation of economic growth and uh, energy centers in their respective countries um, now have become the synonym for air pollution and land degradation. And I'm referring to the coal regions uh, in, in Europe. Uh, and this also applies to Western Macedonia, um, which is basically uh, the energy hub of Greece. Um, now, the White Dragon project that was submitted to the Greek call of expression of interest, um, uh, it was mentioned earlier by, by, by the other speakers, um, was basically born out of the ashes of the delignification decision taken by the Greek government uh, and out of the, of course, newly established IPCI for hydrogen process. Um, it is my belief that only through, through initiatives like the IPCI um, process, um, these projects can be implemented at the, at the scale that they are uh, intended to. Um, because otherwise, of course, and I think um, uh, the, the previous speakers already outlined it very briefly, that, that basically you have the challenge to overcome the main obstacles, which are, of course, costs, especially in the initial phase. Uh, we also talked about transitional phases. Um, if natural gas will play a role, will hydrogen production through steam method reforming and CCS, CCU um, technologies play a role or not? These are all discussions that are you know, being held on the European level, on the high level, on the commission level. And, and we need to, to, to stay focused, I think. And we should, as, as member states, um, also focus on the opportunities that we have right now uh, in order to, to trigger the process of, of um, deploying large-scale hydrogen technologies and fuel cell technologies, basically. Um, I will share my screen real quick. Um, I will not, it will not take too long because I know we are behind schedule. Um, okay, so basically, White Dragon, I, I basically outlined what is uh, written here on the on the on the uh, first slide? Um, Mrs. Duku also mentioned the the signature of the 23 EU member states uh, on in past December of the manifesto. Um, the IPCI process was basically announced on the same day. Um, the hydrogen strategy and the clean hydrogen alliance followed later. And in the course of 2021, the EU will notify dedicated projects and allow an up to 100% funding rate should certain preconditions be met. This is, of course, something, um, uh, let's say, first of a time. Uh, we, we didn't see that yet on a European level, these funding rates and the, the scale that they can reach. Um, this, of course, goes hand in hand with the uh, set target by the European Union um, to, to scale up electrolyzer capacities. Um, previous speakers already mentioned them, so I don't want to go into it again. Um, the White Dragon project is basically a cluster project. Um, I think uh, Werner Diewald mentioned the um, the potential of, of you know, uh, deploying integrated projects. Um, it's true that it's quite challenging and difficult to just build an electrolyzer or just uh, build a, a, a single piece of equipment that maybe fits in a broader spectrum. I think the IPCI process foresees this um, by having set up the matchmaking process that will follow next month, where basically all the IPCI proposals will be reshuffled, um, new partnerships will be uh, determined in order to interconnect different IPCIs between uh, member states, because at the end of the day, the idea is to create one European IPCI, which will be um, comprised out of, of the different national IPCIs. So White Dragon uh, goes a step further. It is an integrated project because it's quite large and because it covers almost the whole value chain of hydrogen. Um, the idea is basically to fill the gap of uh, the delignification process that will um, pose several challenges to the region of Western Macedonia. Um, 
The core of the White Dragon is basically the utilization of gigawatt scale dispatchable renewable electricity, short term energy hydrogen storage and green combined heat and power um, through the uh, usage of high temperature fuel cells. Um, furthermore, we have uh, the development of a high tech R&D and innovation hydrogen hub in Greece. Um, the capitalization of existing energy infrastructure, we already touched upon that as well. Um, so basically we are referring to the natural gas pipelines for long-term storage and the transportation of green hydrogen with the establishment of an energy met metering system, which I will uh, touch upon a bit later. Um, also, um, the White Dragon project foresees the implementation of a dedicated hydrogen backbone pipeline in Greece and the build up of a national hydrogen mobility sector, um, which was um, described by Franz Lena earlier. In addition, through TAP, the trans adriatic Pipeline, cross-border clean hydrogen transfer will be enabled for Greece to Italy. So this is basically an overview of how the system would work during the day. Um, so you have basically solar energy, um, going to the solar panel, producing electricity, which partially goes to the uh, grid directly, and uh, the, the surplus uh, electricity energy will be fed into the electrolyzer in order to produce green hydrogen. Um, one part of the hydrogen will go to short-term storage facilities, and the rest will be injected into the pipelines. Now, during night or when in demand, um, basically the process will uh, be reversed. So you will use hydrogen um, in order to feed it into the fuel cell, in order to produce electricity, feed it to the grid. Um, and as a byproduct, because the fuel cells we are deploying will be um, high temperature fuel cells, they will have um, as a byproduct heat, which you can use in order to feed into the district heating systems of the regions. Will uh, who, who, who will uh, face a, a, a big challenge once the, the um, lignite powered power plants will be uh, decommissioned. Um, so here are some, some key innovations, some numbers. Um, so basically we will have, we will be using, as I said, dispatchable renewable electricity from the grid. Um, 500 megawatt PV will be directly, directly connected to the electrolyzers and will basically uh, feed the electrolyzer constantly with uh, electricity from, the P from this PV. Um, we have the use of different hydrogen technologies in a complete system, which has not been deployed yet, I think not even on a global uh, level. So we have alkaline electrolysis of 4.65 megawatt. We have a solid oxide electrolysis, 350 megawatt, high temperature fuel cells, solid oxide fuel cells and the heating capacity I was mentioning earlier for the district heating demand. Um, others innovations uh, include the energy net meeting through natural gas pipelines, which is basically um, intended to, to create a, a, on, on higher demand days or periods of time to um, receive basically the energy out of the natural gas pipeline by previously having injected the same amount of hydrogen into the pipeline itself. Um, as I said earlier, the third innovation is the dedicated 100% hydrogen backbone pipeline, the gross border hydrogen transfer through trans Adriatic pipeline, and of course, the other uses which include um, the hydrogen usage in refineries, fertilizer companies, and in the mobility sector. This is basically um, the whole value chain, um, just for showing how this looks um, all together. Um, it's basically what I described earlier, just for your information. Now, the numbers. Total investment costs around 8 billion euro. Um, this will lead to the hydrogen production of 250,000 tons a year. Um, we're expecting CO2 savings around 11.5 million tons a year. Um, the social dimension, of course, very important, was mentioned earlier as well by Werner Diewald. Um, 18,000 direct jobs, 29, around 29,000 indirect jobs as well. Um, since the 
biggest part of the hydrogen will be injected to the pipelines. Uh, we have 28,000 to 71,000 tons a year for the utilization in other sectors and appliances. These might include private cars, garbage trucks, lorries, uh, industry buildings, everything that I explained earlier and everything that is basically foreseen by the European Commission and the European uh, Clean Hygiene Alliance. Our partners include um, many players, the most important stakeholders of the Greek energy market, as you can see. Um, we as DEPA are the coordinators of this effort. Um, we think that this project has a huge potential to become a lighthouse project in Europe. Um, I think the potential of Greece is, is given. I think the, 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 the most important part is to, to find the way how to go forward and um, translate the potential into actual projects. Um, White Dragon comes to do exactly that on a large scale and in order to also tackle a, a, a real problem that is basically on our footstep. Um, except for our partners, uh, we have also supporters, the, of course, the region of Western Macedonia, the cluster of bioeconomy of the region, um, solid power, Denora, electrolyzer manufacturer, Mitilineus, and uh, Vepa International projects. Um, that's basically from my side. Uh, I'm happy to, to answer questions if there are any. Um, I would also like to maybe um, comment on something that uh, Mr. Lena um, said earlier uh, about the mobility sector and if there is room for, for hydrogen vehicles or fuel cell vehicles or how you want to call them. I think that, and I think everyone will agree that this is not a competitive technology. I think we should think more as complementary. I think that uh, many technologies will go hand in hand. Uh, I think in the coming decades, uh, which is considered widely as a transitional phase, I think we will also have dirtier, let's say, uh, technologies that will uh, come along the way uh, until we will reach basically the envisioned green economy that we want for, for Europe. So for the mobility sector, I think hydrogen vehicles will play a role in heavy duty, long range. Uh, while batteries, of course, will uh, have their role in the urban mobility sector and in the um, in, in in smaller distances uh, where this is necessary. Um, just as a comment and maybe to kickstart a, a, a small discussion on our panel. Thank you very much, Mr. Moraitis. And uh, indeed, DEPA is going a fascinating way in considering also the structural transformation and thinking it as a chance when also retrofitting lignite areas. And um, I think you have considered also various fields along the, the hydrogen value chain here and uh, cases, we have also similar discussions in Germany and going on in, for example, the federal state of Nordrhein-Westphalia or also internationally seen um, examples in Chile show also that uh, retrofitting existing infrastructure can have also positive uh, climate but also socioeconomic effects um, when you look also at the job creation. Um, you have already started now the discussion with your provocative <laughs> comment here or additional comment. Maybe I ask Ms. Dalena here directly if you want to, to comment on, on that directly. Um, the, I, yeah. <laughs> no, I don't think it was controversial because um, I, I think we all agree that passenger cars will probably be a very small um, segment for, for fuel cells and, and hydrogen. Um, but, but there's no reason to exclude them. That, that was my point. So if, if we have a refueling infrastructure, a hydrogen infrastructure for trucks, um, buses or other applications, that there's really no objective reason why not to also um, use that infrastructure for passenger cars where they have a market, where they don't have a market, they will not come up. Um, but for example, the Swiss example where Hyundai is now delivering the first fleet of fuel cell trucks um, shows that um, it, it goes perfectly hand in hand to also then use those um, refueling stations for some um, of the Hyundai Nexos fuel cell cars that are available in Switzerland. 
Um, but, but I think it's a question that we can really leave to the market and, and don't have to have a dogmatic uh, decision from top down to rule anything out. Thank you so much, Mr. Moretis. There is a comment and question also from the audience directed to you concerning the potential of using hydrogen to produce synthetic fuel as it was addressed by Professor Capras earlier this day. Does this also reflect the official position of DEPA? Uh, since I am currently talking here about White Dragon, uh, this has nothing to do with the official position of DEPA as a company. Um, what we are, because I need to answer to, to the synthetic fuels question, this is not part of the project, obviously. Um, we are focusing on, on a different path in this regard. So no, in, in, in this uh, part, we're not uh, including synthetic e-fuels in, uh, in, in White Dragon. Mm -hmm. And maybe here also the question you have, Mr. Moritz has mentioned also the residential sector at some point. I think the residential sector is not prioritized in Germany yet, but uh, maybe I can ask you, Dr. Rolle, how maybe also the, the residential sector is perceived in, in the hydrogen uh, context in yeah, Germany at least. <laughs> I would agree. I think uh, for at least large parts of the residential sector, there are other technology options that are probably cheaper or easier to fulfill, whether it's heat pumps in, in new um, buildings for, for families, whether it is the existing uh, grids, um, heat grids in cities. But of course, uh, similar to the other um, sectors, there are always different segments in these markets. And there are also segments um, in, for instance, older buildings where heat pumps don't make sense as you can't really renovate them to the level that you want to see them, uh, where also other uh, decarbonized fuels make sense, whether it is directly hydrogen or uh, methanol whatsoever. Think of uh, literally a couple of markets rather than just the one market, and then you will come to, I think, many solutions. Thank you. Maybe I add here a question uh, to you, Dr. Rolle, um, since also the point of the gas pipelines was mentioned earlier or several times today. Um, there are discussions also on or fears of lock-in effects when it comes also to, to support um, new gas infrastructure. Um, where is also your, what are your thoughts about lock-in effects? Uh, are those fears um, yeah, is it clear or is it is it more like um, we should rather um, not exclude this option as well? Well, I think for gas infrastructure as well, for as for a hydrogen infrastructure, we need more or less very similar uh, pipeline infrastructures within Europe. And what we've learned from the past is that having many options is an advantage. It is an advantage in buying um, gas at the moment from different sources, um, whether it is from Eastern Europe, from Northern Europe, from LNG hubs, um, and having a very well-established physical market as well as an economic market, gas market, uh, has helped to bring down costs uh, also in, in regions that have paid high prices in the past. So further competition uh, is helpful to bring costs down and this will hold also for a hydrogen market. Um, we clearly see at the moment, uh, as a first step, it's all about the transport grid. And we want to see a 100% hydrogen transport grid in Europe, as there are customers who will need pure hydrogen, as well as others that in the end might also um, make use of blended versions of whatsoever mixtures of um, methane and, and hydrogen. But in the first place, I think establishing uh, this hydrogen grid by also making use, as has been said, uh, of large parts of the existing gas grid that has can be devoted uh, for these purposes is the first step. And then in the end, we will see to what extent the distribution grid uh, for hydrogen will have similar size or smaller size compared to the existing gas grid.
Thank you for clarifying uh, that, um, Dr. Rolle. So gas pipeline is one option also for transport, but also there are other energy carriers for transporting um, the hydrogen. And here I pick up a question also raised by the audience, which I would like to direct to you, Mr. Lena. Um, asking that there are also experiments with methanol and uh, would this be another way of transporting the energy without pressure? Um, yeah, so this this entire question about global hydrogen transport, I think, is, is still very much um, in the discussion phase. So we, we have the recent news about the first liquid hydrogen ship um, that is uh, being equipped in Japan uh, these days, uh, which already shows that uh, it will take quite some time until we can talk about actual pure hydrogen transport across the globe. Methanol is another option. Um, methanol has carbon in it, so to close the carbon cycle adds another um, uh, difficulty there. Ammonia is often being discussed um, with the other nice advantage that there's no carbon in it. Um, and then there's also liquid organic hydrogen carriers where you have an oil kind type of liquid that um, is, is um, where you add the hydrogen and uh, get it out again. Um, so, so these these uh, various options are are all being pursued, um, and I, I guess it's it's also down to the first bigger projects um, that 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 will uh, show what what options are possible in the near term. Um, as Werner Diewald mentioned, also for perhaps for the first bigger projects, uh, blending into the gas grid can be an early option. It's not so nice maybe to not have the clean hydrogen molecule at your end use, but rather use a book and claim method. Um, but for the energy system or for the global uh, climate uh, mitigation, it doesn't really matter. So uh, as long as we replace um, dirty energy quickly with clean energy, that helps. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lena. And uh, thank you, Mr. Moraitis and Dr. Rolle. At this point, I'm very sorry. I would like to continue actually the discussion, but we are running out of time. And uh, therefore, I would like to um, summarize our understandings and insights of today, but also dare to take a look at possible perspectives of the hydrogen development and joint collaboration between Germany and Greece on that matter. And uh, for that, I would like to ask Mr. Lena to rejoin the session. Um, but at the same time, I would like to introduce you, Mr. Konstantinos Papalukas, uh, to that session, to that final remarks. And uh, since October 2019, you are advising the Greek Minister of Environment and Energy on energy policy, infrastructure, and energy investments. And in December 2020, you were appointed as the coordinator of the National Hydrogen Committee, which is mandated basically to prepare the hydrogen strategy of the Hellenic Republic. So thanks for being here with us and concluding the workshop. And uh, Ms. Alina, may I ask you kindly to start and then followed by Mr. Papalukas. Sure, thank you. Yeah, I will try my best to summarize the, the key points of um, the speeches that have been delivered by the German side throughout the day. Um, so um, the workshop started with, uh, with words from the ambassador, Dr. Reichel, which um, emphasized the um, possibility of a Mediterranean alliance in, in the context of, of hydrogen and um, hydrogen as a topic that can bring Greece and Germany closer together. Um, then um, We've heard from the State Secretary Thomas Rachel from the Federal Ministry of Education and Research, um, who emphasized uh, also collaboration on the research and innovation side, um, acknowledged that, that we need hydrogen to decarbonize the hard to electrify sectors, most of all. But he also um, alluded to and emphasized that um, hydrogen offers an opportunity for economic prosperity and job creation and pointed to Asia in that context where things are currently moving a bit faster and where we in Europe should um, make sure that we are um, catching up and, and use that as an opportunity. He concluded with um, hydrogen being an option to trans transition from the original idea of the European Union of a coal and steel union towards an European hydrogen union, which was a theme that has then been picked up um, by, by other speakers uh, throughout the day. Um, then on the German side, next was um, Deputy Director General Ulrich Benterbusch from the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy. Um, some of his key points were 
to emphasize that Germany currently imports more than 80% of our energy and um, that we should um, not um, have the illusion that we will be self-sufficient anytime soon. So um, importing green energy in the future is um, what, what the government expects and, and, and is needed. Um, and speed is key here, we emphasized. So um, scaling up to reach our targets that have now or are currently being made even more ambitious is very important. He also pointed at uh, being pragmatic in the early years of, of the ramp up of green hydrogen, um, referring to the delegated act um, as part of the RED, the Renewable Energy Directive from Europe to not make the criteria for using electricity in renewable hydrogen too strict. Um, and, and then he also um, iterated on the point that high transport applications can be a lever for enabling early business cases and that we should use a technology open approach. Um, then we had a presentation from Werner Diebel, the chairman of the German Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Association, who, em who emphasized the, the European story behind green hydrogen. Um, I think he used the words of, of sharing our common wind and solar resources across the continent and um, using pipelines as an integrative element to, um, um, yeah, to connect us, not just um, economically, but also as, as a continent in, in the European Union. Um, and um, that is also a point that Dr. Kirsten Westphal from the uh, National Hydrogen Council in Germany um, emphasized um, the role of the natural gas grid across Europe that already connects um, us in, in many ways. And um, that this is an infrastructure asset that we can then also, in a, in a longer term perspective, uh, trans uh, um, convert to hydrogen to, to use that pipeline network to connect production and use of hydrogen. Um, and she concluded with uh, Europe has to act, it's uh, has to get its act together and scale up the hydrogen valleys. So a, a clear statement for, for urgent action that is needed there. Um, Dr. Carsten Rolle from the um, um, he is head of the Department of Energy and Climate Policy of the Federation of German Industries, the BDI, um, emphasized the need for industry to get green molecules to decarbonize. Um, not all can be done pure electric there. And um, he uh, showed us again how much is going on globally, how many hydrogen strategies are being released by different countries, and um, emphasized the, the hydrogen as a tool for international technology collaboration. So I think from, from what I have heard throughout the day, there's a very common understanding about the challenge that we are facing. I think there's also a common understanding about um, that it has to start in, 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 in reasonable scale, like through hydrogen valleys, through the common projects of, of your common European interest at the next scale. Um, most people have, uh, most speakers have referred to uh, a technology open approach being useful here and the industrial policy angle, the potential for economic growth has also been emphasized um, at, at various stages. So with this, um, I hand back. And I hand over to Mr. Papalukas directly. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Honorable Dr. Kelemis, dear experts from both countries, dear friends. Uh, Kalispera, good and tag. Should, should as it doesn't. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you today and provide uh, the concluding remarks uh, of this uh, great workshop. Uh, the time for this workshop couldn't be better. However, it comes uh, with a very hard task to consolidate all these great points that have been made and shared and make sure that we haven't skipped anything important. So as uh, Minister Scrag has mentioned earlier, thanks to the leadership of the German presidency in the continuation of the same strategy uh, by the Portuguese presidency, we are certain that uh, a European hydrogen economy is possible and plausible. Uh, it has been also mentioned by the general secretary that uh, hydrogen is no longer an afterthought, and it's not. That hydrogen is not the, cham is, is, is not the champagne of our energy transition, but the table water. Perhaps desalinated would be even better. Uh, I actually read earlier this morning the phrase that uh, hydrogen uh, is the Swiss army knife of, of decarbonization, uh, an amazing metaphor illustrating 
uh, the versatility of its uh, application. Just skimming through the German press, I see the same creativity and ambition from the German energy journalists, uh, Deutschland wird Wasserstoffland, and so on, are some of the titles I read and offer the sense that hydrogen is becoming Germany's energy vendor 2.0. So I'm sure that there have been uh, several lessons learned from this German revolution in renewables, and that could be drawn to help Germany assume the technological leadership in hydrogen and compete with Japan and Korea and, and other first movers on, on te of, of technology or other late movers such as China. Of course, the role of Greece, uh, the role for Greece in this hydrogen revolution is and must be obviously different. Last October, when I was invited to a Hydrogen Europe's event with the representatives of the member states for the IPCIs, my concluding remark was that we need to full up our engines to get uh, on this uh, hydrogen train. And I said, this time allow us to underpromise and over deliver. A uh, few months later, we take pride on the results of the IPCI process, which has just been concluded. Uh, when started this trip in January, the question I had to answer to our colleagues from other ministries was whether White Dragon would be ready as our only proposal for the IPCI. In a period of uh, three months and after dedicated work, uh, we managed to engage with as many interested parties as possible and put them in the acceleration pipeline. And now we can count more than 20 plus projects that have applied and wish to be included in this first wave of the hydrogen IPCI. Well, we know it's not 230 projects, but I'm very pleased to see that this effort has been embraced by our government vertically, involving not only the general secretaries of energy and industry as the, the originators, but also the ones of maritime affairs, transportation, and research and innovation. Two reasons for that. A, through this political uh, symmetrical approach, we managed to attract proposals from different sectors of the hydrogen value chain, such as shipping, transportation, uh, the in industrial units, startups, and spin offs. And B, uh, also, we made sure that the call of expression of interest is aligned with our national hydrogen strategy, which is uh, currently in the making. So, allow me here as a coordinator of our national hydrogen committee to share with you how pleased I am to see that the hard work of the experts participating in the committee, along with the presidentship of Dr. Kapros, is paying off as we will be soon having a national roadmap that meets the Greek energy policy and na national uh, targets. While we're taking care of our country's particularities, uh, we might need uh, still to engage a bit closer with our shipping industry, but I'm sure that everything will fall into the right place as, as at the right time, as uh, we need to envision the new uh, generation of ships and uh, the compromises that comes with the, with the, with the load and everything, uh, whether it's hydrogen or ammonia. And I say that because the maritime sector is strategic to Greece and hydrogen could become a game changer, not only by using hydrogen and, and ammonia uh, as a fuel, but mainly because of the need to connect remote hydrogen production sites across the globe uh, with the hydrogen markets by somehow emulating the LNG market. It might as, as my colleague just mentioned, uh, it might take some time, but we will be getting there. With a doubling of the demand, as Mr. Divald say, men, uh, mentioned by 20, uh, in, in, uh, 20, by 2030, and as described in the German hydrogen strategy adopted last June, it is uh, quite clear, I quote, the domestic generation of green hydrogen will not be sufficient to cover all new demand which is why most of the hydrogen needed will have to be imported from several places across the EU, where large quantities of renewable-based electricity are being generated and, other great potential for, uh, and offer great potential for producing green hydrogen. This is a strategic opportunity for Greece to intensify our cooperation with Germany and other European member states. Uh, as a potential green hydrogen upstream, upstreamer, but also uh, as a gateway of renewable hydrogen produced in North Africa and the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, why not look Greece as a hydrogen port or even a regional hydrogen hub of, of the future as our Hellenic energy exchange is taking off. So yes, we're open to jointly develop production sites and at the same time provide investors the security to plan ahead. 
it is important to note here the importance of reducing market uncertainty. Uh, as in the case of renewables, the creation of long-term offtake agreements under the PPA scheme remove market risk from installation projects, leaving mainly uh, technical challenges to be addressed. So perhaps we need to wait for the first hydrogen, hydrogen purchase agreement or similarly to the CO2 uh, purchase agreement. Moreover, special focus should be given on uh, scaling applications uh, and technologies that create the biggest improvement for investments to drive the cost down. Therefore, we would welcome a more targeted cooperation with the large German industrial players, especially in the field of te technology transfer. Moreover, one has to take into account though that we as a country need to take a stride forward to cover the lost ground when the majority of other member states made everything into smaller steps. For example, the European Hydrogen Backbone Group recently presented their vision of nearly 40,000 uh, kilometers of uh, hydrogen pipeline infrastructure in 21 countries by 2040, with 70% of the proposed hydrogen network being brownfield repurposed existing natural gas grids. In Greece, we're juggling multiple balls as we are still on our way to expand our gas network to Western Greece and Northern Greece, and also make the decision if our companies should start building greenfield hydrogen pipelines. At the same time, we need to proceed with building a sound infrastructure and upgrade our electricity grids, as the electricity demand is set to rise in the next period uh, because of the uh, ample electrification the uptake of e-mobility and the upcoming interconnections of our islands with the national grid. This makes imperative the need to meet the growing demand with green, affordable and clean energy. At the same time, upgrade our electricity ne networks and promote uh, smart grids, demand side management and so on. And move forward with uh, our cross-border interconnection. This is where hydrogen could be the Swiss army knife that I mentioned in the beginning and hydrogen could be the ideal solution for the North interconnected islands, as General Secretary mentioned during her talk. Last but not least, the transportation sector. A country with the same population as Greece, Portugal, that concluded the first hydrogen commercial deal with the Netherlands of green hydrogen and green ammonia, has just announced that green hydrogen is reaching pumps in uh, Douro gas filling station by 2022. Uh, the same goes for a renewable gas station uh, and biomethane station, again, 2022. So why not Greece? This, is my, this might be a, a very good reason to repatriate some of our high caliber scientists who are currently working abroad and turn brain drain into a brain game. To conclude, our position is that a, a comprehensive European hydrogen policy is needed and our two countries might work together towards such direction to create the, the, the cloud and, and set the right mindset, as mentioned in the beginning. A common strategy could help the EU remove the unnecessary barriers to accelerate the emergence of a greener, but not over-regulated over -regulated hydrogen uh, economy. At the same time, this would enable us uh, to get a better understanding of our internal market and better forecast uh, our hydrogen imports needed once the European demand and production capacity has been reliably estimated. So, dear friends, uh, Greece aspires to develop massive solar and wind power installation to produce green hydrogen and further utilize our substantial unharvested renewable energy sources potential. And we will uh, need all the help we can we can get from our allies to build scales, follow best practices, and do that efficiently. The future seems uh, bright, let's jointly harvest it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Papalukas, and thank you, Mr. Lena, for these strong words, final words. Your remarks and suggestions are well noted. And uh, with these conclusions, I would like to close this first exciting Greek-German expert workshop on green hydrogen. A warm welcome or thanks, I would rather say, to all the speakers of today and the organizers and the teams, especially the German embassy, the AHK and GIZ, 
and the Ministry of Environment and Energy for making this exchange of today possible. Thanks to the technical support also in the background and also thanks for the audience following attentively and contributing to the discussions. I wish you a good day.